All right, well, uh, hello YouTube. So I am joined by Lance Bush today. Um, well, Dr. Lance Bush now, right? Uh, you, you have uh, successfully defended the thesis. So I'm also a doctor with two doctors. That makes us both experts. So we are the, uh, we are the reliable sources. That we, we are the uh, sources of truth. Um, <laughs> like, anyway, what we're going to be doing today is talking about uh, metaethics, and we're going to give a, a tier list of some of the arguments for moral realism. This is not going to be an exhaustive list of arguments for moral realism. We're just going to look through some of the arguments for moral realism, and we're going to rank them from the best to the worst. Uh, that's what's happening in this video. Uh, so, Lance, do you have anything you want to say by way of introduction? Uh, I guess. I don't think the last time I was on your channel that I had my channel going yet. So I do have a channel now. So I could, if it's okay, I'll mention it now. It's called Lance Independent. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's also uh, a blog, also called Lance Independent. So you could check those out. And a lot of it focuses on meta ethics, although I'm starting to shift more into meta philosophy stuff. And I did uh, just finish the PhD, but I should say it's in psychology. So I don't know if I get to, to claim to be any kind of expert in philosophy. <laughs> okay, well, very well. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, basically, uh, as I said, we're gonna be making a, a tier list of arguments for realism. Um, now I, there is a website called um, Tier Maker that has these really funky looking lists and everything. But the thing is, is that in order to use Tier Maker, first of all, you have to like create an account there, and then secondly, you, 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 you can only use pictures. And I and I wasn't really sure how to represent all of these arguments with pictures. So uh, this tier list is going to be uh, a lot less sophisticated. It's just a list on a uh, Word document, but. Doesn't matter. The point is, we'll talk about these arguments and rank them. And, and uh, I mean, I, I guess if any if anybody has encountered either of us before, they know that we're probably both. They probably know that we're both very much on the the anti-realist side. Um, but I I am going to insist that we uh, make an effort to put some of the realist arguments uh, in the at, at the top of the list, right? Um, so basically, I should say, yeah, the way this works is there's like six categories. Uh, at the very top is is S tier, which which basically means like the best. Um, and then it, it goes A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and that's from best to worst. I'm not actually sure why the top is S tier, but that's how all of these list, what, lists work. I, I don't know why it goes S, A, but it does. So that's what we'll do um, on this one as well um and yes that's that's what we'll do okay so uh yeah do you want to do you want to get get started with it yep let's do it okay cool um all right well first up then uh we have the companions in guilt argument the companions in guilt argument for moral realism um i guess maybe uh yeah we should probably we should probably start by saying a little bit about what each of these arguments is. Um, so with the companions in guilt argument, this is a little bit tricky, actually, because there are a whole bunch of different companions in guilt arguments. Uh, the general idea of a companions in guilt argument is going to is going to be that if you are an anti-realist about uh, moral normativity, um, that's going to commit you to anti-realism about other things and usually the idea would be that it's going to commit you to anti-realism with respect to other kinds of normativity. I think probably the most popular companions in guilt argument would be that um, anti-realism about morality commits you to anti-realism about epistemic norms. So we don't, we're not, you know, we don't just make claims like, you know, you ought not to torture people or, uh, you know, it, like slavery is wrong. We also say things like uh, you ought to proportion your beliefs to the evidence um, or, you know, flat earth theory is unjustified, things like that. Right. So we make uh, normative claims with respect, not just to what you ought to do, but what you ought to believe. And uh, the, the charge is that if you are a moral anti-realist, then you're going to be committed to 
uh, anti-realism about these epistemic norms. And that's supposed to be a, um, a pretty significant bullet to bite. Uh, because you're going to end up having to say that, you know, if you're, it looks like if you're an anti-realist about epistemic norms, well, there's just, there's not really any fact of the matter, or at least no stance independent fact of the matter, whether or not flat earth theory is justified, or whether or not uh, it's rational to, to apportion your beliefs to the evidence. Um, so uh, that's, that's the challenge, right? Like, uh, moral anti-realism is going to commit you to anti-realism about epistemic norms, and anti-realism about epistemic norms is just completely absurd. Uh, do you think that's a fair representation of the uh, of the argument yeah roughly there's probably some some nuance one could add to it but i don't think that that doesn't strike me as a mischaracterization it is typically paired so i mean typically there's a sort of parody premise where you know moral realism is going to stand or fall contingent on whether another type of normative realism stands or falls with it typically the expectation is that people are not going to want to give up that other domain of normative realism and so they're not going to They'll be like, all right, well, I guess I can't give up moral realism either. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, any any particular thoughts on this on this argument? Uh, <laughs> um, I do have a, I, I do have a number of thoughts. Right. <laughs> I also am curious where you are going to rank this, because I think I already have a decision and I'm going to take make my decisions before I hear yours. I don't okay. know if we should be willing to adjust them afterwards if we end up disagreeing. Yeah, that's a... The first thing I'll say about this is that I'm actually fairly sympathetic to the parody premise. The other thing is that, uh, well, I should just say this. I was a normative anti-realist about all normativity prior to ever encountering companions and guilt arguments. And so I remember the first time someone presented one to me, <laughs> it, it's like, it, it, to me, it felt like someone saying, hold up, you don't believe in Bigfoot? Well, <laughs> if you're not going to believe in Bigfoot, you would have to like not believe in the Loch Ness Monster and not believe in alien abductions and not believe in, in you know, unicorns. And so, and this felt very much the same way. I was like, yeah, I don't believe in any of those things. I think they're all mm. absurd. And I don't think there's any good reason to believe in any of them. And I feel the same way about any other category of normative realism that I don't think there's good reasons or, or good arguments. Someone might say, ah, reasons. I think reasons could be understood in anti-realist terms. So, I didn't find this even remotely compelling. And so the first thing I should say is this argument never had any force with me simply because I just am totally fine with accepting the parody premise and, and not concerning myself overly much with any other type of realism. I don't find any of them to be attractive. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, I was uh, in exactly the same position when I first heard this. I remember feeling somewhat baffled that this had been presented as an argument for realism, because I, my reaction was just like, well, yeah, I mean, I, or, I am already an anti-realist about epistemic normativity. Actually, it, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that it almost feels like um, like an argument from a, a kind of weaker case, because, I mean, just speaking for myself here, like, I, I have you know, really quite strong reactions when it comes to at least some moral claims. So if you take something like slavery, I think slavery is just absolutely horrifying. Um, so that provokes this like really strong emotional reaction. Now I'm saying I'm an anti-realist about that. Now on the other hand, when you when you take these like claims about epistemic normativity and you say, well, people ought to apportion their beliefs to the evidence, or um, well, you know, flat Earth theory is unjustified. I mean, okay, yeah, maybe I'll agree that flat Earth theory is unjustified, but I, I would much rather live in a world where everybody believes in flat earth than a world where people are getting enslaved. Um, you know, so, so it's kind of strange to like, see, to me, I almost want to say if I was, if I was going to be a realist about any kind of normativity, I, I, I guess I would find moral normativity the most appealing um, just in terms of like how much of a pull I feel towards it. Um, whereas the, the epistemic normativity, I can kind of take or leave it. So, um, I mean, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, that's, uh, that's just my, that's just my reaction. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I'm perfectly happy to accept, um, the, uh, the parity premise. And then I'll, I'll just say, I, I'm not a realist about epistemic norms. Um, I think that one, one thing that's worth noting about the companions in guilt argument is that, I am not sure. I, I mean, I guess there are there are going to be like different ways of of 
framing the argument. But I think that on the most plausible ways of framing it, I'm not really sure that it's even an argument for realism as much as it is, as it is an argument like against certain ways of arguing for anti-realism. So, for instance, um, you know, like anti-realists might uh, make the complaint that moral normativity involves a commitment to, uh, like moral realism involves a commitment to some sort of idea of categorical normativity. Um, so, you know, there's like desire independent reasons for action or whatever. And then this is supposed to be something bizarre or queer, as someone like Mackey would put it. Um, and then the companions in guilt argument can kind of kick in and say, well, you know, uh, it's not just uh, the moral facts that have this supposedly queer feature. Uh, epistemic facts are going to have that queer feature as well. Um, and so, so that, that's like, that, it, that way of putting it doesn't, doesn't exactly get you to realism. What it gets you is that there are certain arguments for anti-realism that, that don't work. Um, but, you know, that might just sort of leave you with, okay, well, there's no particular argument for anti-realism, um, but that in itself isn't, isn't going to convert you to realism. So, um, I, I would just wonder, like, how far the companions in guilt arguments can get you, even if they were successful. Um, but, yeah, I, so, so for that reason, I, I, I would worry about them, at least in the context of persuading people to become realists. But. Well, there's a particular thing someone could do if you try to make the move of just saying, OK, well, I'm a sort of global normative anti-realist and I reject epistemic realism, which is that they could say that's not really a position that you could believe or that you could endorse because it's self-defeating. You know, if you reject epistemic realism, then you don't have any reasons to endorse epistemic anti-realism. And so you you are not justified in endorsing it. And that might be a kind of a objection that could be leveraged. So there's a sort of two step process that one could imagine someone making. First, they argue for a companions and guilt argument. Mm -hmm. You reject the argument by accepting the parity premise. And then they say, that's fine. That's one way you could take the argument. And in fact, they could even present it as a dilemma rather than an argument, which is either you have to accept moral realism or you have to accept epistemic anti-realism. And if you go, OK, well, I accept that ep ep epistemic anti-realism, they could then say, OK, well, now you face the problem of self-defeat. And so the, the argument can be a sort of it could have this sort of um, like two tier approach. And then it, its value could be derived from its role in sort of a. Le being leveraged towards that self-defeat argument. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think I think that's fine. But there's so to be clear, when I when I was sort of suggesting that maybe it doesn't get you all the way to moral realism, the the concern is more like this, right? So let's say that moral normativity and epistemic normativity are on a par with respect to the thing that worries the moral anti-realist. So maybe it's that there's a commitment to categorical reasons and we just say, you know, categorical reasons are queer or they're unintelligible or whatever. Um, so we might say, ah, well, look, you already believe in uh, epistemic normativity. Epistemic normativity involves a commitment to categorical reasons. Um, so what does that mean for moral normativity? Well, that in itself doesn't get, I mean, like, okay, well, now I can say, well, look, the the objection that I had to moral normativity maybe doesn't work. Um, but like the mere fact that both of these involve a commitment to, categor to categorical reasons, that like, okay, well, that, that doesn't in itself mean that I have to accept moral normativity. Um, I mean, it would be kind of like if somebody uh, just, uh, you know, just, just as, an, as an analogy, right? Like, you know, let's say that um, somebody says that, you know, there couldn't possibly be a God because God is supposed to have a mind and, um, you know, minds are just you know, really weird, right? They, they, what the hell is a mind supposed to be? Um, and then someone says, well, hang on a minute, you already believe in people and people have minds. Um, so, well, so what? So you should believe in God? Well, that doesn't really work. I mean, I think that the, the so there is that the argument that you used against the existence of God isn't successful. Um, but that doesn't oh yeah, I wasn't disputing you. that. I I agree that I think it can expose mm -hmm. an inconsistency in the way 
some anti-realists might leverage objections to anti to moral anti-realism, like you know, they might raise an objection that's based on moral like moral realism having certain sorts of characteristics or commitments or properties that they're like, okay, I don't accept those. And then if someone can convince them that other things they do accept also have those properties, they don't have a good argument anymore. They're they're going to have to either yeah. withdraw their objections to realism or add the other things to the list of things they object to in order to be consistent. I'm on board with that. I'm just, I was just pivoting to another thing that could count in favor of a companion's guilt argument, oh, which see. is that oh, it could be so leveraged right. yeah. for a sort of second second order argument, which is that the, the proponent of the companion's guilt argument could say, look, you can make that move. So we're gonna, we, we've successfully dispensed with bad, inconsistent anti-realist objections to moral realism in particular. We've got the moral anti-realist on board with rejecting epistemic anti-realism, but now we have a problem that's distinctive to epistemic anti-realism that's not a problem for rejecting moral realism, which is that epistemic anti-realism to try to endorse that position is in a certain sense self-defeating or self-undermining. And so the, the companions and guilt argument can kind of funnel people towards an unattractive position. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, my, Obviously, my view is I, I don't see anything in particular that would that would make epistemic anti-realism self-defeating. Um, uh, I, I think it's perfectly sensible to say that I have, you know, I can say, well, I have reasons for my beliefs and uh, I'm going to cash that out in terms of, you know, well, maybe, for instance, I just want to have true beliefs and I want to avoid false beliefs. And then there are going to be ways, or at least there's going to be ways that I take it are more or less reliable at achieving that or something along those lines. Right. Um, so I could I could just give, you know, an, I could give an argument uh, to the effect that epistemic anti-realism is correct. Um, I wouldn't have to say that this is an argument which is in, in some sense like um, that gives you like a stance independent reason to accept epistemic anti-realism. I could just say, well, you know, if you if you want to have correct beliefs, right? Here's a, here's why I think epistemic anti-realism is correct, and you know, take it or leave it. If you don't if you don't want to have correct beliefs, then uh, obviously that's not going to move you. Right. So I would I would give basically the same response, and I'm also completely unmoved by these sort of self defeat responses because. They seem to presume that the conditions for success, like the conditions to avoid defeat, require or call for certain sorts of concepts that I have denied myself. But in addition to denying any type of normative realism, I also deny that the realist concepts that I am sort of, uh, you know, renouncing, that I need those in order to meet some standard of success. Uh, you know, maybe I don't meet the realist conception of success conditions, but I'm rejecting their conception of success conditions outright. I don't care to to play the epistemic game by their standards. So what I find strange about these arguments is that um, they often seem to grant that the anti-realist is capable of rejecting certain components of the realist perspective, but then they sort of try to retain this requirement. Well, okay, you can reject that there are stance-independent epistemic reasons for belief. But if you do that, you still would need stance-independent epistemic reasons to be justified in believing that. You don't have those, so you're not justified in believing that. Well, uh, so much for your account of justification that I don't care about that. I, I don't think that, it's not just that I, I you know, I'm gonna variously say that I have problems with whether I even think that it's true or whether it makes any sense or whether uh, I'm, I find it in some sense non-trivial, but um, I could, always just say, okay, well, you know, I endorse some other conception of justification or reasons or whatever, and I succeed on those terms. And what, what's the problem? And, you know, I, I just, I'm not that motivated to try to operate within a sort of pre, like a sort of circumscribed framework that is presumed to be one in which I must operate and for which I don't think a good argument has been given in the first place and that I don't find intuitive and that I don't think has many theoretical merits in its favor, and that while they might say most ordinary people subscribe to this view or it's intuitive among ordinary people, I don't think that's true. So I think that a lot of the sorts of appeals that they would want to make for trying to maintain the success conditions that I purportedly 
couldn't meet, I'm not convinced by any of those either. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, though, that this creates, because these sorts of positions are sort of, it's like a layer cake of presumptions, that when you start rejecting all of the presumptions, you know, if you reject one, if you're like, okay, I reject moral realism, um, that's seen as some type of skepticism or a radical view, which I already don't grant. But when you start rejecting, like you peel down back the onion of presuppositions and presumptions that the realist is bringing to the table, and you're like, yeah, I reject that too. And they bring up another consideration, yeah, I reject that too. They can then leverage that to say, well, you're an extreme skeptic. You reject everything. I've given you all these presumptions. I've given you five or six. You reject all of them. This is so you can do that. That's consistent, but it's a radically ridiculous, skeptical position. And I think that that itself is is a kind of there's it's like an argument by implication that it's it's like if I keep enough presumptions at you and you deny them all, that can make you look like you're doing something that is dialectically suspicious. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, for what it, I, I suppose I, I, I mean, to put my own cards on the table, I would just be happy to accept the extreme radically skeptical uh, implications of, of this. I, I, I'm happy to just throw out justification and truth and all of that. Um, if, if that's where, you know, this is going to take me, then so be it. I, I, I'll accept it. But um, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so... Um, Okay, yeah, I, I don't know if maybe we should just sort of come to a decision about where to put this. I think that um, sure. my feeling is that uh, it's, I, I don't find it remotely convincing as an argument for moral realism. I think maybe it's useful as a tool for sort of un uncovering maybe presuppositions or something that we're making in, in these debates. Um, and I mean, certainly it's, I mean, look, it seems like there are some people who deny moral realism, but do want to maintain some sort of epistemic realism. And, you know, the companions and guilt argument is going to push them to give an account of, well, like, OK, why is it that moral normativity is problematic, but epistemic normativity is perfectly fine? Right. Um, so it's not completely it's not completely useless. Um, I. But I. I. I'm actually not sure what the sort of standards I should be using for uh, assessing these arguments uh, is. I, I... I was about to raise the same concern. <laughs> right. So we have a, at least a couple options. Right. One is to rate them sort of relative to one another. Mm -hmm. So whatever one you think is the best might get an S rank. And then, you know, whatever you think the worst would get like an E. But we could also try to rate them as, with respect to some sort of absolute standard or, or like this external standard that is less relativized, which I guess is kind of ironic. Uh, <laughs> given what we're talking about, yeah. um, not that I think that implies realism uh, about the about the ranking. Um, I'm inclined to go more with the latter because I think it, I, if I'm really honestly assessing them, they get they all get bad grades. It's just a question of how bad. Um, yeah. Well, I, so as I've as I've mentioned, we're not allowed to put them all in the E tier. Some there's got to be at least one in the S tier. Um, I, I I will say that with the companions and guilt argument, right? I. First of all, I don't find it remotely convincing. Secondly, I find it a little... Maybe this is just what I've experienced, and maybe this is, it's not fair to judge the argument in as, as on these terms, but there's so many realists I've encountered who are, like, so smug about this particular argument that it just, it's it, like, annoys me. Um, like... <laughs> I'm just I'm just annoyed about this particular argument. Like uh, they seem to think that they've got this like knockdown response to anti-realism, and I, I don't know. I I think there's a whole bunch of ways out of the companions and guilt argument. So it it always frustrates me when it's like presented as though okay, well that's it. Like and anti-realists, <laughs> you know, game game over. You know, uh, you, you're all committed to like crazy radical skepticism. So that's it, game over. Um, so uh, anyway, I think I would be inclined to put it in um, maybe maybe C tier. Um, I don't think I could put it any we higher. Agree so that. far, I went with C. Oh, cool. Okay, <laughs> okay. There we are then. Well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna type in companions and guilt in in C tier. And, yeah. Uh, so I could just say briefly why I would give it C tier and not like a lower grade. So like you, I don't find it convincing at all. But I think. 
the reason I would bump it up a few points is because I think it moves the dialectic forward. And I think that is of substantial value. I think it does put pressure on any moral anti-realist that wants to reject uh, epistemic uh, anti-realism or other anti-realist positions. And I think that pressure is significant. I think they, I would say they should reject all forms of normative anti-realism. Uh, sorry, all they should reject all forms of normative realism. And so I, I think that at least in that respect, it can it can move anti-realists in the direction I think they should have gone in in the first place. So it does yeah, something. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. I mean, um, so okay, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a useful tool, but it's not necessarily a useful tool in terms of getting us to moral realism, uh, because right, and that's because. But this is this is going to be true of pretty much any argument. You know, right. one philosopher's modus ponens is another's modus tollens, and I just tollens where I think they want me to ponens. Um, Yes. Okay. Um, so the next one that I have on the list is uh, the deliberative indispensability argument. Now, um, this comes from uh, David Enoch um, in his book, Taking Morality Seriously. I've, uh, I'm, I'm just going to read from my, my notes here because um, I want to make sure I state the argument correctly. So um, the argument works like this. Uh, so premise one, if X is instrumentally indispensable to an intrinsically indispensable project, we're justified in believing that X exists. Premise two, deliberation is intrinsically indispensable. Three, objective, irreducible normative truths are indispensable to deliberation. So we are justified in believing in objective, irreducible normative truths. And so the basic idea of this is, um, so this idea of instrumental indispensability, um, we would say that like, we'd say that the X is instrumentally indispensable to a project just in case you can't eliminate your belief in X without undermining your reasons for engaging in that project. So for example, it seems like belief in God is gonna be instrumentally indispensable for prayer, right? Like if, if you're expecting prayer to have any success, it, it seems like you need to believe in the thing that you're praying to. Um, and then this idea of intrinsic indispensability is um, there are some types of projects that we just can't avoid doing, like they're, they're sort of non-optional. So with prayer, well, uh, I kind of can't, I, you know, you can avoid doing that, right? I, I don't pray, so it's not a problem. Um, but deliberation, looks like something that is non-optional. Um, I have to deliberate. I, I sometimes have to ask myself, like, what should I do? What should I believe? You know, so I can I think to myself, like, should I pursue a philosophy PhD? Would that be the best thing for me? And when I do that, when I engage in this sort of deliberative process, I'm trying to discover something. I'm trying to figure something out. I'm trying to get to the right answer. Um, I, I, you know, when I ask, should I pursue a philosophy PhD, I don't create the answer. I find it by thinking through reasons for and against doing a philosophy PhD. So, you know, there's a, there's a fact of the matter which decision it would make sense to make. And deliberation is the sort of tool for revealing reasons for and against the decision. Um, and that's why we're supposed to be committed to believing in uh objective reasons um i hope i summarized that uh fairly i think that's that's basically the idea <clears throat> um, so yeah what what at what point is there an argument for why the like a, a belief so it's is it that we uh, deliberation requires a belief in objective irreducible moral properties or just that that they exist yeah, well, actually, um, I'm not sure that it requires a belief in objective, irreducible moral properties. It's more specifically objective, uh, irreducible, normative reasons. Oh, OK, so this um, is just normal. OK. Yeah. So so actually, this is another case where this argument in itself is even if it's successful, it's not actually going to get you to moral realism. It will get you to, to normative realism, um, but it won't get you. Right, to OK, realism. fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but is it, I, I was just, I couldn't recall exactly what you said about the particular premise. Is it that you have to believe in them or they have to exist? You have to believe in them. Um, because, so if you think about something like prayer, 
um, if I do not believe in God, then it wouldn't make sense for me to pray to God. Uh, or at least I, right, I okay. wouldn't be able okay, to okay. say that I expect to get, I expect it to be successful, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know why I even ask because that's that's got to be what it is. Um, and I think I think when you discussed this before, I think you did a video on this where you raised one objection and someone could say, well, just because you believe in it doesn't mean it's got to exist. Isn't that one potential reply? And then Enoch has a reply to that. Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I can't remember the exact details of you know, what Enoch okay. said, but I do have a video on it. Yeah. So if, if people are interested, they can they can go and uh, see that for, for more information. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm not inclined to make that move. I'll I'll just grant that maybe Enoch has a good reply to that particular move. I guess I just, I'm not quite sold on how it's the case that I'm required to believe in these irredu in like irreducibly uh, normative facts in the first place. Why are those required for deliberation? That, I'm not understanding why that's the case. Yeah, so as I understand it, the um, the idea is, so, okay, let's say that I'm I'm deliberating about whether or not to pursue a philosophy PhD, right? And... In, in doing this, I have to consider, uh, I mean, there's various things I'm going to consider. I'm going to consider um, my desires and what would best satisfy those desires. And that question, obviously, is just sort of descriptive, right? So if I have a particular goal and then I try to figure out, well, what would best satisfy that goal? That's just going to be a, a descriptive, uh, like a descriptive claim. There's no, no need to believe in normativity there, at least as far as I know. Um, so... So the thought is that in in cases of deliberation, although although it's going to appeal to my desires, we can't just identify reasons with desires um, because, well, the idea the idea would be something like this. One option would be to say that um, the fact that an action will satisfy your desires counts as a reason to do it because it matters that your desires are satisfied. But if you say that, well, that's the, that's, that claim is then the desire independent normative truth. So the, you know, uh, it matters that your desires are satisfied or the fact that an action will satisfy your desires counts as a reason to do that action. Um, that claim is then going to be the objective, irreducibly normative truth. Um, so, reasons are not going to be fully reduced to desires on the other hand if you say that having a reason like there's just nothing more to having a reason than than having desires uh then then i think enoch's concern is that um it's going to turn out that reasons are problematically arbitrary so your desires you know like you you, you can just you can just have desires for you know they can just sort of happen right like i just have whatever desires i have um but it seems like i can deliberate not just about what to do or what to believe i can also deliberate about those desires um and so the like the desires in themselves are just going to be these arbitrary things and the point of deliberation is to remove that kind of arbitrariness um that does it, does that make any sense at all <laughs> does that yeah. uh so I could see why the first one would be a problem, and I, mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't make that move. It's just going to just bring some type of normative realism in through the back door. So I'm not going to yep. go with that. The second one, I'm not really sure I'm, I'm getting. Like, what is the problem with arbitrariness? Like, I'm just not seeing what the problem is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure either. Um, so the claim that Enoch wants to make, as I understand him, is that the point of deliberation is to remove arbitrariness, right? Like, so it's like we could make decisions just on a whim uh but we have this thing this project let's say called deliberation which allows us to remove the arbitrariness of making de decisions just on a whim um so instead of like flipping a coin to decide whether or not to do a philosophy phd i think through the reasons for and against it and that process is supposed to lead me to the right answer, um, or at least to a non-arbitrary answer. Uh, where, whereas if you say that reasons are merely desires, then it's going to turn out that reasons are ultimately just arbitrary. Uh, and so deliberation obviously wouldn't be able to remove arbitrariness in that case. Yeah, I guess I'm just, so I would want to get super clear on what 
is meant by arbitrariness. And, you know, I might be concerned that arbitrariness, there's at least two different types of arbitrariness, and there might be some kinds of arbitrariness I wouldn't be okay with. But the fact that I desire some things over others, if someone wants, and, and then I'm motivated to act accordingly, and then when I deliberate, I'm trying to act in accordance with achieving my goals or my desires, whatever they happen to be. If someone says, okay, but your desires are arbitrary, okay, that doesn't trouble me. I'm not bothered by that. Um, but the other thing I just say is I don't, take it to be the purpose of, like the purpose of deliberation to minimize arbitrariness. I take the purpose of deliberation to be to figure out how to get what I want. That's all I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly care. Uh, like I, I want what I want. I don't, mm -hmm. I, someone's saying, but what you want is arbitrary. Uh, what? So, so what? Yeah. I mean, there seems to be like, there's, there's different kinds of arbitrariness, right? I mean, so I might be thinking to myself, should I do a philosophy PhD and then I, I just flip a coin um, and I, I don't put any further thought into it? Um, that's one kind of arbitrariness. And then there's like, let's say there's a process of deliberate. Maybe I shouldn't call it deliberation. Uh, Shmi liberation, <laughs> if you don't want to call it deliberation. But then I could I could be sitting down and sort of thinking to myself, well, you know, I really enjoy philosophy. Uh, you know, I like writing philosophy articles. I want to learn more about it. On the other hand, philosophy PhDs don't get paid very well. I'd like to ha I'd like to earn money. You know, so I'm kind of weighing up these things. And it, it seems like my desires there could just be arbitrary. So maybe my desire to pursue a like maybe my love of philosophy is just completely arbitrary. Um, and my desire to earn money is just completely arbitrary, right? I don't have any further reasons for them. But I, I mean, so what? It looks like I have those desires. And now given those desires, I can sort of weigh things up in light of those desires. Um, that seems relevantly different from the case of just flipping a coin. Um, now, if you want to call them both arbitrary, all right, fine, then maybe I'll just say that I'm okay with making arbitrary decisions. Um, yeah, I would reject the former because I don't want to use decision making procedures that are not optimized for achieving my goals. But in the latter case, if I'm simply trying to decide what would in fact facilitate achieving my goals, call, saying that the goals themselves are arbitrary, I, I guess I just don't I don't even know what I, I'm not entirely sure what exactly that means. But insofar as I can make sense of it, I don't feel the force of that. It doesn't seem like a problem to me. Maybe they are arbitrary. Um, yeah, I think but so I basically think that's, that's my reaction to this argument so far is that it looks like I can I can either contest the conception of deliberation on offer and just deny that deliberation needs to have the sorts of things that Enoch seems to attribute to it. Or and I think I've seen other people make this move. If someone wants to say, look, just analytically or, or you know, just as a matter of like what the nature of deliberation is, this is what it's about. I could just say I'm I'm fine with dispensing with deliberation, and then I might go back and reject that deliberation is indispensable, and then I can engage in you know schmiliberation, right? And and then I'll engage in some type of schmiliberation where my, the only factors that are relevant to the decision making process to the schmiliberating are facts about what's consistent or inconsistent with go, with like goal success or my desires, and then that's what I'm doing. And arbitrariness is just not a factor there. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I I think I pretty much I, I feel the same way. And another point I would make about about this particular argument um, is, I I wonder uh, like even if we were to accept all of the steps of it, um, I can't help but feel like okay. So what what is it that I'm sort of left with? Well, I guess I'm left with the idea that like when I'm deliberating, I have to believe that there are these objective irreducible normative truths um but but then you know like it's so it seems like i could you know draw a distinction between sort of i don't know everyday contexts and the kind of context of like sitting in a philosophy seminar room talking about these kinds of arguments like so it, it could it might be the case that i would i would have an account where um like well yeah, maybe when I engage in everyday deliberation, I just have to believe in these objective normative truths. But then, like, w why does that mean that when I'm assessing a philosophical argument, uh, or like, sorry, why would that mean that 
there couldn't be a successful philosophical argument to the effect that there are no uh, objective normative truths. Um, so, you know, there are some um, there are some moral error theorists who will say that even though moral error theory is true and there are no moral facts, uh, we should just continue believing that there are moral facts. So jo Jonas Olson says this kind of thing, right? So these are these are the moral conservationists. They'll say, well, yeah, there's no moral facts. And of course, when we're, you know, when we're doing philosophy, um, we think about the arguments for and against moral facts and come to the conclusion that there are no moral facts. Um, but when we leave the seminar room and just, you know, go back to ordinary life, we just start believing in moral facts again. Um, so, you know, we just have false beliefs. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why we couldn't take the same sort of view of this uh, of this deliberation argument, um, I mean, maybe it's maybe it's a bit tricky because I suppose assessing an argument is itself a kind of deliberation. So um, maybe we are just committed to uh, yeah, if the argument is successful, we would be committed to objective, irreducible, normative truths just across the board. But um, yeah, I don't know. That it's just one other way that you, you know you might respond to it. Yeah. Um, Okay, then, so uh, I'm, I, I, I don't think this is as good as the companions in guilt argument. Um, Neither do I, so yeah. <laughs> it's just a question of whether it's a D or an E. See, uh, I, so what I'll say is this. Okay. Uh, it looks like, even from a rough sketch of it, I, I can sort of chart a course for a few possible replies that I think could be tractable. But what I'll say about this, and the reason I'm going to give this a low ranking, is because pending additional argumentation, I, I'm not even sold on the idea that these types of irreducibly normative facts are, are needed for deliberation in the first place. So I feel like I have a bunch of backup moves, mm -hmm. but I'm just not convinced by the initial premise, you know, that particular premise where you'd like these are needed for deliberation. Sure. What's the case for that? Like I get, but the other thing I'll say in defense of the argument is you just sketched out the argument. And of course, when someone sketches out an argument and they have a particular premise, they might say, look, that premise might look implausible in the face of it, but I'm going to do a bunch of work to show why you should actually accept that premise. Yes. And then that's a bunch of stuff outside of the context of the formalization. I haven't seen that. And so it makes it, so I'm going to give it the grade that I'm going to give it, but pending the possibility for it to move up the scale if I find out more. Yeah, I mean, I do want to be clear. Look, I, it's been a, a little while since I've read Enoch's book. I may not have presented it in the fairest way. Um, so, you know, don't take my word for it, right? Um, I, I am going to say that this argument gets uh, a D, and the reason why I'm giving it a D is because I don't think it's as good as the companions and guilt argument. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I I don't know. There's something. There, there's just like that. There is a kind of um, c creativity to it that I can appreciate, and I, I appreciate that it's like, um, it's it is sort of it's it's a novel argument. Um, it it doesn't seem to be all that similar to like a any other argument in the literature um and i suppose in in a sort of similar way to the companions in guilt maybe it could help move the conversation forward if you know i mean if it turns out that there is some that there is some way of like uh tying a so okay let me put it this way it does seem reasonable to say that when we deliberate um we we think about our reasons, right? If I, if I just put it that way, that seems fair enough. Like I'm thinking about the reasons for and against my, like my choice. And so you are gonna have to give some account of, well, like what, what's going on there? Um, what are those reasons? Um, and so maybe in, in that sense, it, it perhaps can, can uh, play some, some useful role in moving things forward. So personally, I, I, that's why I'm going to put it in, in, in the D tier. Um, so I, I'm inclined to put it in the E tier, okay. but I think that there's probably stuff that I'm more opposed to, and I don't know enough about this one, so I'll defer to you on this. Okay, fair enough. Well, then in that case, it just goes straight in the... Uh, straight in C, uh, D tier, D tier, right. Okay, uh, next up, we have moral convergence, the moral convergence argument. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, um, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if you want to explain any of these, I'm happy to explain them, or I, I, I didn't I, I'm to. I'm enjoying you so, explaining them. 
Okay then. So um, the moral convergence argument, as I understand it, is going to be something like this. Um, when we look at the development of human societies over the past few hundred or thousand years, um, we find that there's been uh, an increasing convergence in their moral views. So uh, we find people increasingly converging towards sort of more liberal attitudes. You know, I mean, we, we used to have societies where people would like, you know, enslave each other and oppress other races and oppress women and so on. Uh, gradually, what we found is uh, a convergence towards the idea that like all humans have are, are worthy of equal consideration in some sense. Um, so, you know, we no longer enslave people. Uh, it's no longer considered acceptable to discriminate against uh, other races or other sexes, etc. Um, and then the thought is, well, how do we explain this? Right. What's the best explanation for this convergence of moral views. And the realist will say, well, the best explanation is um, people are reasoning about morality and they are over a long period of time, you know, it's not easy, but over time they're able to reason their way to the correct moral beliefs. Um, and so, you know, we, Basically, the, the picture that the realist has is human beings, you know, we're, we're obviously very flawed and limited. So, you know, we start off with a whole bunch of appalling moral views. Um, but over time, we're able to reason our way to the correct views. And that accounts for why we've seen this convergence towards uh, more liberal attitudes. Um, that's basically the argument. <clears throat> All right. Should I start by commenting on this or do you want to go um i mean you, you, you can go i guess i just said stop all right so, so <laughs> i don't know how you're going to react to this but this is the one i'm going to say is probably what i think is the best argument for moral realism okay now part of the reason why i think that is because it's actually attempting to account for a tangible real world um, observation that i think is reasonably well established yeah. i agree that there has been convergence in people's moral attitudes, beliefs, and standards over time, um, and you know, uh, so I, you know, there's some there's some nuance here, but uh, you know, because there's a difference between progress and convergence, and you don't want to conflate, uh, you know, progress with convergence. Right, Sometimes yeah. people do that. We'll say, well, there's been moral progress, and there's something kind of question begging about that because that's that's tying a, a an evaluative claim into the very observation that's being offered. Whereas if you just focus on the fact that people are moving towards similar moral standards, you get around that. You're just dealing with a descriptive claim. So, with you know, and I, I know that the better arguments focus on convergence. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that I tend to take a very holistic uh, approach to evaluating arguments. I, I, you know, I don't tend to like really simplified deductive arguments or focusing on a specific syllogism and then treating formalized ver versions of arguments as being either total failures or totally knockdown arguments. Rather, um, I take each of them and I sort of weigh them up against all the other arguments and considerations for and against a particular position. And I try to chart out a sort of um, where, I, where I stake my territory philosophically in terms of weighing a broad range of considerations. And I'm naturally inclined towards a, a sort of abductive approach towards drawing conclusions. And this argument is an abductive argument. It right. takes some observation and then says, what's the best explanation for this, this observation? Um, and so uh, it's employing a type of inference that I think is a, a one that's powerful, useful, and I have a natural affinity for. And it's doing it based on a tangible observation of real world uh, phenomena that I actually think are true and that I think it's pretty easy to establish are true. So, you know, I think some people might argue, actually, there's been less convergence, yada, yada. I'm willing to grant that there just has been. So I'll grant it those things and then say that it's it's like on the right track for what I would take a, a good explanation or a good argument for moral realism to be. So I'll start by saying that. OK, OK. Yeah, I suppose I, I, I mean, I probably disagree here because um, I'm not as... Uh... I, I don't think that inference to the best explanation is a, is particularly convincing just in general in terms of so I, I mean to be clear um, it's certainly very useful um, I agree with that but um, 
I don't in general believe in the things that are postulated as part of the best explanations for phenomena. Um, and so even if it were the case that moral, you know, objective moral facts were the best explanation or part of the best explanation for moral convergence, um, I think I would still be pretty sceptical of objective moral facts, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, for that, for that reason, I'm, I'm probably going to end up putting it lower than you will. Um, and then I, I guess as well, uh, I, I just think that anti-realists have got a whole bunch of ways of uh, accounting for what's going on here. And, and actually, I think that their explanations are, you know, by, by most of the, let's say, the usual theoretical standards that we use to assess explanations, I suspect that there's going to be anti-realist explanations that are just better explanations by those, by those standards. Um, so the fact, for instance, that uh, what we've seen over the last few hundred years uh, is increasing globalization, increasing interaction between different cultures. It isn't particularly surprising when you consider that, that the values of those cultures might start to converge. Um, that's, that's actually what I think you would expect. Um, in the same way that like, you know, if you have cultures that regularly interact, you'd probably expect that their fashions and food preferences would start to converge. Well, yeah, in the same way, their moral values are probably going to start to converge as well. Um, so yeah, people use, yeah. people use potatoes and fried chicken all <laughs> over the world. There has been, I mean, this is another case where you could use the gastronomic parodies and you could argue for gastronomic convergence as a type of argument for gastronomic realism. Right. Yeah. Um, so you could point out, look, I mean, mo what is it? Pro it's probably most countries have a McDonald's in them. Is that evidence of gastronomic realism? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, uh, I remember um, I'd be, I, I went to Istanbul quite recently. Um, well, it was last year, but um, um, I, I remember like being struck when I went there. Uh, I mean, it was it was great, but there were times when I would sort of look around and be like, this could just be, you know, this could be anywhere. This could just be any, any city. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, there are some places that sort of still have a, a kind of very, like unique culture to them where you sort of feel like you're in a different world but there's a lot of parts of the city where it it just feels like any other city it, it, and um and so there's been convergence not just with respect to moral norms there's been convergence in you know with respect to so many different things um that i i don't think that the moral convergence is is so surprising Right. So, you know, I'm certainly not going to accept moral realism on account of convergence. I just take it to be to have the form of argument that I think is a, is a good approach to establishing that a particular account is correct. Yes. But I do take I, you know, I would have you, if I had been asked what I think the better explanations are, I would point to, well, we have completely mon I mean, before we start appealing to and positing new properties and phenomena and facts to explain things, I would have thought we would first turn to the mundane facts, facts about human sociology and psychology. And, you know, the forces of globalization are one of them. And, you know, the standard type of analogies and, well, not analogies, but comparisons that I would appeal to would be, you know, fashion, music, food, you know, and the food point I think is, is really critical because there, you know, prior to globalization, certain recipes and types of food were only accessible in certain parts of the world. So, you know, a lot of the, the fruits and vegetables that now have made their way all over Europe and Asia, um, those fruits and vegetables came from North and South America, Central America, you know, potatoes and, and other sorts of things. And now they're everywhere in the world. Um, you know, a pizza, for instance, uses tomatoes and you could probably get a pizza pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, is that evidence that it's objective, like pizzas are objectively good? I think that's ridiculous. We can explain this by appealing to similarities in human attitudes and desires. And as cultures, and environments, and technology change with globalization, you get greater uh, homogeneity in the environmental conditions in which people are in. And insofar as cultural influences, psychological changes, environmental uh, 
greater environmental homogeneity, greater social interaction, all of those factors can account for why people would become more similar to one another along numerous dimensions. But you'll notice, um, you know, there are there are differences. So different countries are going to have their own take on pizza and French fries and and, and um, uh, fried chicken is one that I, you know, I think of because I think of all these like different places where, where there's like different approaches to fried chicken. Um, like a, there's a place near here that does a Korean fried chicken. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's like all the, I don't know where I'm going with this. I just like talking about food. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, you know, these particular types of food preparations have spread all over the world that weren't there a thousand years ago. And are we tempted to say, oh, well, it must be because people are, they're all reasoning towards recognizing what the correct food to eat is, what like the objectively good food to eat is. That just seems silly. Like, no, it's just, uh, people are similar to one another. And so when you provide recipes and opportunities to prepare those recipes, people will tend to converge on having the same sorts of recipes. I, there's nothing, I don't find anything mysterious about that. And I wouldn't posit extra facts to account for that. And I don't know why we would do that for morality. Okay. So um, I suppose, you know, you've already said that this argument is, you find it probably the most convincing of the lot of them because of the form that it's taking, the, the, the approach that it's taking. So I, I, I would guess it sounds like you're inclined to put it in, in S tier. Um, where would I put this? I mean, because I, I need to make sure that I am going to put something in S tier. Um, Do I have to pick S tier? I think I'm putting this in A tier. Okay, well, this. something has to go in S tier. Um, uh, there, there will be something that goes in S tier. Okay. Um, maybe you'll object, but I'm putting this in A. Where would I put what this? I, I don't, I can't bring myself to put this in A tier. Um, hmm. This is a, this is a tricky one. I think the thing is, is that like, okay, so like I said, I have this general concern about the idea that inference to the best explanation is truth tracking, but I can very easily like, I, I can easily see why people hold that it is, and I can kind of easily get on board with the like. So I can put myself in that perspective, and then if I do that, I can think, yeah, okay, this form of argument does, you know, that 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 is, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, maybe better than some of these other arguments. Um, yeah, I'd probably be inclined to go with like B or C. Um, so, uh, so now we have to dis so. Uh, are we are we producing different lists or are we, have we got a compromise? I've because... got my own list, but okay. if you have the canonical list, right. then well, we might need to compromise for that list. Okay, well, we you know what? I'll, I'll just compromise and I'll, I'll accept the A tier for this one. Um, so there we go. We'll, Fair we'll, enough. Yeah, put moral convergence into A tier. Okay, then. Um, right. Well, uh, next up we have... Uh, intu well, I've said intuitionism slash phenomenal conservatism um there's actually like a a whole bunch of different types of arguments that are all very very similar as as we will see because there's, there's others on this list that are kind of similar um so basically the idea of this sort of argument would be something like this um so uh, basically the phenomenal conservative will say uh in general so this is a a general claim about how we form beliefs in general uh, if it seems to you that P is the case, then in the absence of defeaters, that gives you reason for believing that P is the case. So right now, for instance, you know, I, I look uh, at my table and it seems to me that there is a cup in front of me. Um, and so the phenomenal conservative will say, yeah, I mean, like you, you have this visual appearance. There's a visual seeming that there's a cup in front of you. There's no particular reason to doubt it. So you're justified in believing that there's a cup in front of you. Um, or like I can remember uh, earlier today, I remember uh, eating a carrot. Uh, <laughs> and again, there's no particular reason to doubt that memory. So I'm justified in believing that I ate a carrot earlier today. Uh, so this is a, a very general claim about, um, you know, about all beliefs, right? Like there's various different kinds of seemings there's perceptual seemings, there's intellectual seemings, there's memorial seemings, you know, and seemings justify beliefs. And among the seemings, there are moral seemings. So it seems to be the case that uh, torturing babies is wrong. And 
there's no particular reason to doubt that torturing babies is wrong, so you're justified in believing that torturing babies is wrong. That's... that's basically the idea. All right, this is our S tier. <laughs> this is you're putting this in S tier. I think I think okay. something's got to go there. I think this is going to be it. Okay. Um, do you want to uh, do you want to explain why? <laughs> why? Yeah, these are these yeah. kinds of arguments are really hard to respond to, mm -hmm. and I think that the kinds of like the in intuitive appeals are the kinds of of positions that realists take that are the most incorrigible and the sort of the, the I think that they are the sort of a uh, last defense that realists would have if you just if you dismantled all their other arguments I think this is the one they're not going to give up right yeah um I think that you know with philosophical arguments in general there's I always see them as kind of coming in in like two classes you get these very sophisticated technical arguments where you have like 11 premises and, uh, you know, each premise has got like seven sub premises and they're really beautifully intricate, intricately structured. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think those sorts of arguments ever really convince anybody. Right. People adopt the right. positions that they adopt on the basis of. Like, you know, there are some things that just kind of feel right. Um, and I, I do. I think for a lot of people, it, it really is it, just going to seem like realism is it's just sort of obviously like of course of course it's morally wrong to torture babies and of course that's not just my opinion right that's a, that's not just my opinion like it's clearly a fact that it's morally wrong to torture babies i i, I think that that is um you know it that that uh, that kind of argument gets at something which like really is motivating realism right like it's uh it's yeah, expressing but, something that think about it this way if there were no, if the deliberative indispensability argument had never been made, or moral convergence argument had never been made, or companions and guilt had never been made, do you think there'd still be moral realists? Because I do. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you took away the intuitive, or the ar appeals to intuition, <laughs> right? Yeah. Are people gonna are there are people gonna go around having little or no in intuition in favor of realism? Then they'll hear companions and guilt or deliberative indispensability and go. Ah oh, shit. Okay, I guess I'm convinced realism is true. All right. Well, I didn't want it to be true, but I guess it is. That's not how I see realism framed or presented by its proponents. Its proponents are seem to me to be like, hell yeah, realism is true. It's intuitive. And then all of the arguments that come after that are window dressing. They're not essential. What's essential about it is the fact that its proponents find it intuitive. Um, I think another point I, I would say in favor of this is it does so it does try to relate the case for realism to a, a more general epistemology which I mean does have some plausibility I mean um, you know the, the idea that well like ultimately if you think about what your beliefs are based on like in the end it's just going to bottom out in something seems to be the case to you I mean I, I think there is like some plausibility to that. It's certainly, I mean, it's not like, a, it's certainly not a crazy position, right? Um, that, yeah, I mean, so obviously, you know, if you ask me, if you ask something like, well, why do you believe the Big Bang occurred? There's going to be a, a very sophisticated chain of inference getting you to that conclusion. But like, ultimately, what is, what is it going to be based on? Well, it's going to be based on, you know, I've just looked at a graph or something. and And then why do I believe that, why do I believe that there are actually splotches on the graph in the way that I think there are? Well, it's just because that's how it visually seems to me. Um, so I do sort of appreciate this. I, I can I can understand this idea that, yeah, you know, um, ultimately our beliefs are always going to bottom out in these seemings. Um, that's the case for everything. So why wouldn't you similarly trust your moral seemings? Um, yeah, there's a few concerns I do have about this, though. Uh, the biggest concern is simply that I myself don't have these seemings. And so <laughs> right. this kind of argument without someone bringing more to bear, like if someone said, look, it's not it, if let's say there's just two people and another person says it seems to me that realism is true and they're an epistemic peer and it doesn't seem that way to me. We're at an impasse 
if that's the only consideration we're, you know, that's on the table, seems to you, doesn't seem that way to me. Okay, we're, we're not going to get, we're at a tie. Uh, realists might then, though, say most people that have considered this are realists or have these seemings, or most people in general have these seemings. But then they're starting to make additional types of arguments yeah. that go beyond just a direct appeal to their own seemings. So if the realist, you know, says to me, don't you have the seeming? Isn't that the strongest reason for you to endorse this? Um, if I did, then it might be, but I don't. And so what I'm left with is other people reporting that it seems true to them. And at best, even if we accepted phenomenal conservatism uh, and granted that they are justified in being realists, at, at least insofar as it seems true to them, in the absence of defeaters, okay, but I'm also justified in not being a realist on right. the same grounds. So some, there's something that I find unsatisfactory about the at least the phenomenal conservative element of this, which is that all it provides you is a type of private justification. It doesn't provide anything that amounts on its own to a substantive publicly valuable argument. It's not like if we were detectives, you know, if we were two detectives in a case and someone says, look, I got this strong hunch that, you know, Alex down the street did committed the murder. Maybe that is a reason. Let's grant that that's a reason for them to think Alex did it. They trust their hunches. Okay. If I don't have their hunch, um, I could rely on like an inductive inference. Maybe, you know, 80% of the time they've had hunches before they've been correct. Now I do have evidence that it's Alex down the street. Um, but if I don't know this person and I have no idea whether they're, you know, and it seems to me like I actually have a, a contrary hunch that Alex didn't do it. Ah, oh, they seemed innocent to me. I'm not going to take that too seriously. Um, so, but if they point to the body and, you know, it's carved into the, the corpse's chest, Alex did this, ha ha ha. <laughs> um, and there's Alex's fingerprints on the knife. Okay, now we're talking. There's publicly a valuable evidence for me. Part of my concern with these, these phenomenal conservatism appeals is there's often, they're at best, all they are is private justification. So they, that doesn't get me anywhere. But the other problem is that I often see them, if, if phenomenal conservatism and direct appeals to one's own intuitions are where one stops, then it, it doesn't provide us with these public, publicly valuable arguments. And that is, I think, dialectically useless. You can only preach to the choir with these arguments. Um, but I also think that these arguments, and this isn't a sort of intrinsic feature or like a logical entailment of them, but I think they tend to bleed over into other often implicit presumptions that go unstated. So those that make the phenomenal conservatism appeal in defense of moral realism um, often seem to presume that other people share their intuitions, including me, to the point some of them are so confident that if I tell them I don't have realist intuitions, they're incredulous. And I've even had people tell me that I'm lying or I'm pretending not to have the intuitions mm -hmm. or that I'm I'm delusional and that I must have the intuitions. So there's something, there's there's a sort of, there's, a, there's I think, a risk of appealing to one's own to intuitions of a profound overconfidence that those intuitions are in some sense shared or universal, either as a contingent feature of the way other people reason, or even as a sort of universal feature of the way any rational agent would reason. So someone might even think, look, any reasonable person is going to have the same intuitions I have insofar as my intuitions are the output of like a rational process. And I, I think that both of those presumptions are mistaken. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, okay, this is why I, I would be i really don't want to put this into s tier <laughs> and the, so the the reason why is because i just don't have those intuitions um so you know it it's, it would be one thing to say well do you so if somebody said to me okay do you have the intuition that torturing babies is wrong i'd probably say yes to that right like i'm very strongly against torturing babies so fair enough i have that intuition but i don't think that that really does anything in terms of getting you to moral realism because like I, like that could just be a kind of emotional response or it could it could like be based on what i take my values to be what you need in order to get to moral realism would be the intuition that it is a stance independent fact that torturing babies is wrong um and i i have i, I mean i don't have that intuition in fact if anything i i think i have the opposite intuition my intuition is that that's false so it is a stance independent fact that torturing babies is wrong my intuition is that's false so in the absence of defeaters, um, I guess I'm justified in being a moral anti-realist, right? And so, yeah, I, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like this argument actually 
if anything, it kind of just backfires. It's like, it feels like what, if I was to accept the epistemology that you're putting forward, I now have more justification for being an anti-realist. Um, <laughs> so I, like, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like this is a very good argument for moral realism. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Is this I, being distinguished yeah. from other in intuitions? So you had... You have phenomenal conservatism. Is this being distinguished from the Morian shift and the other ones? Oh yeah, I've got Morian shift as a separate argument. Um, okay, and is this yeah. one specifically phenomenal conservatism? You know what? Maybe we should just say. I mean, I put like intuitionism slash phenomenal conservatism, but I, let's just say phenomenal conservatism just to make it. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, so it if we're considering phenomenal conservatism just on its own, uh, I'm I'm tempted to respond in a similar way and say that in and of itself is. I want to say something like rhetorically or dialectically or argumentatively inert. It does nothing for me. It doesn't move me towards realism at all because I don't have the intuition. And as you say, if 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 what we're being offered is, hey, you can get to moral realism if you employ this ep particular epistemic framework and you go, OK, great. What is the epistemic framework? Oh, well, you're justified in believing what seems to be true in the absence of defeaters. Oh, well, it seems to me that re anti realism is true and realism is false. So. Thank you. Thanks. And now I have a, a you've just added, uh, you know, another weapon into my own toolkit insofar as I grant that this is a tool to be used. So I'll grant that point specifically for phenomenal conservatism, which means this gets a lower score. Okay, then. Um, so Can we give it an E then? Because it's actually anti persuasive. <laughs> I, uh, do I want to put this in E? I mean, the, the, let me, because mm, E is like the absolute worst. And you, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put it in E just because, as I said, I think that, right, so here's the thing. Yes, it is anti-persuasive for me, but I can totally see how it would be persuasive for others, right? Other people do have these intuitions. And as I said, I can understand the plausibility of the phenomenal conservative epistemology in general. So I, I, I don't know, I, I'd be inclined to put it in like C tier, maybe. Um, I'm okay with yeah. C, let's go with that. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, so far, we haven't had any. So I think this could have gone in the direction of this being like I'm with S and you're with C. But <laughs> I was thinking more broadly of the entire apparatus around which sort of appeals to intuition function. Yeah. And a lot of things follow from that, which we'll get to. Um, yeah. Okay. So next up on, on the list is the Morian shift. The Morian shift. Um, so. Morian shift works like this. Um, let's say that somebody presents an argument against uh, moral realism, so an argument to the effect that there are no objective moral facts. The Morian will say, well, the claim that there are objective moral facts, the claim that it is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun, that claim is more plausible than any philosophical premise you could use in an argument to the contrary. Um, so I, I, I mean, look, uh, yeah, there's, you know, it may be like the, the evolutionary debunking argument or something, right? Like, so the evolution, maybe somebody presents an evolutionary debunking argument and they say, you know, well, uh, like if these claims about human evolutionary history are true, then our moral intuitions are not truth tracking. Well, okay. But how plausible is that premise compared to it is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun? I mean, surely nothing could be more plausible than it is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun. So, uh, any t so if there's any argument for anti-realism, then we sort of we we know that denying the conclusion is going to be more plausible than accepting all of the premises. Right? We should we should deny the conclusion, um, and so that's going to tell us that one of those premises is wrong, rather than accept the premises and take ourselves to the conclusion. Um, that's the Morian shift. Yeah, this is, this is just, to me, my initial reaction is just question begging, presumptuous, <laughs> done. Um, okay. <laughs> you don't find this, uh, you don't find this at all persuasive. Y um, yeah, of course not, because what I would want them to show me is why. <laughs> the whatever the appeal to realism is is more persuasive than the arguments to the contrary and yeah. that itself would need to be an argument for why it's more persuasive than an argument to the contrary so they would just need to give me some other argument for realism um, i mean this has some affinities 
you know, to what I think this only works insofar as one is inclined to have the relevant kind of intuition. And so, I mean, maybe it's got to go in a similar category to phenomenal conservatism. OK, but, but so I, that's, I don't know. Well, well, you know, what? So OK, maybe the, what if the Maureen says this? Like, well, look, I mean, surely, though. Uh, so this kind of procedure that I'm suggesting um, is, you know, like clearly this is the sort of in general, the way that we approach assessing any sort of argument, right? So there's a bunch of premises which have the conclusion that, uh, you know, there are no objective moral facts. And I can then offer this alternative argument, which says, well, there are objective moral facts. So one of those premises is wrong. So what we're left with then, so we have argument number one, premises which have the conclusion that there are no objective moral facts. Argument number two, there are objective moral facts, so one of those premises must be wrong. Well, now we're just left with a plausibility comparison, right? So we have the claim that there are objective moral facts. We have this set of premises. Um, which of these is more plausible? And clearly, <laughs> torturing babies for fun, well, clearly that's wrong. Um, so that's probably going to come out as being more plausible than these weird philosophical premises. Oh, oh dear. It looks like, oh no, <laughs> technical problems. Uh, okay. Um. Uh, okay, I will pause. Uh, okay, so there was a slight technical issue, but uh, yeah, so the, the, the Morian um, says this. They say, well, basically, there's there's two arguments that we're being asked to assess, right? Argument number one has a set of premises to the conclusion that there are no objective moral facts. Argument number two says there are objective moral facts, so one of those premises must be wrong. And surely, I mean, the claim that it's objectively wrong to torture babies for fun... Um, well, that's, that's, that's always going to be more plausible than these, you know, technical philosophical premises. Um, do you not see any value in this way of, <laughs> of proceeding? <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with someone having that as a, like, the general schema of saying, hey, if, if your conclusion is something that I think is ridiculous and I'm not, it's not obvious to me, what the problem with the premises are, I'm still going to assume there's got to be a problem in the premises somewhere. Yeah. So if someone has this argument and it's really, let's say it's got 73 premises in it. And then the conclusion is um, all humans are carrots or something like that. <laughs> um, I'm not going to accept that argument. Humans are not carrots. And I would be extremely confident that there would be at least one problem, one serious problem somewhere in the premises of that argument. So I don't have a problem with that as a general approach. It's just that I don't have some inclination to think that moral realism especially is especially plausible in the first place. Yeah. And so why would I go around with this heuristic that, uh, you know, any argument against realism is going to be less plausible than realism? Why should I think that? And I, you would need to like, I don't have that inclination in the first place. So it's not like if someone said, you know, if you're going to make this Morian comparison to like hands, well, it does seem to me that I have hands. If someone presents an argument that I don't have hands, um, I actually, I probably wouldn't even make a shift in that case because I don't have problems. I don't have personally a big problem with skeptical views. So someone, you know, if you wanted to make some argument for like scientific anti-realism and then argue that like technically speaking, I don't have hands, um, <laughs> I might be like, all right, well, I, I'm actually okay with that. Uh, I don't <laughs> know if that's something you'd argue for, but I would, I don't have that kind of inclination in the first place for these sorts of brutes appeals, uh, sorry, these sort of brute appeals, um, I could see myself having that sort of, I, I, in other words, I'll say this. I don't have a problem with the procedure of saying, hey, if the conclusion is too ridiculous, there's probably a problem in the premises and you're, you're coming to reject the premises, fine. Uh, but I don't have a general opposition to skeptical positions. I don't think anti-realism, moral anti-realism is a, a notably skeptical position. And I don't share the initial inclination that realism is super plausible. So in this particular case, I don't feel the force of this at all. I don't know what it's doing. Right. Yeah. Pretty, I mean, exactly the same for me. Um, I don't think the Morian argument works even in response to radical skepticism. So I, I certainly don't feel the force of it when it comes to uh, 
moral scepticism in particular. Um, so, uh, but, okay, look, I mean, you have just, so we've gr kind of granted that, well, maybe there is some, uh, there's something reasonable about this general method of assessment, right? Like, you know, if somebody presents 73 premises to, to the effect that you don't have hands, yeah, maybe it's fine to say, well, I do have hands, there's probably something wrong with your argument. So, I, I would put this very low. I don't know if I would put it in E tier, but it's... Let's it, give it a D. D, yeah. The Morian shift in... Um, I think I know what I want to put in E already, and we'll see if we end up agreeing. I think we will agree. So <laughs> okay. I think there's some places where we've compromised, but I think we're going to agree on E. I, I'm, I'm curious to see if we get to it. Okay, then. Um, so the uh, this argument uh, I'm calling the, uh, the, the, the face value of moral practice. And... Um, I don't know if this is really like a, a single argument or if it's just going to be like a, a whole set of arguments, but there's there's a way of um, that there, there so there's a way of like trying to argue for moral realism where we appeal to just maybe that actually this this isn't so much an argument for moral realism. I see this used more commonly as a kind of burden shifting move, where the idea is supposed to be well, if you just look at moral discourse and moral argument, then uh, either it like just kind of contains realist presuppositions uh, or, or maybe realism is like the best explanation for what's going on there. I mean, so for example, um, if you take the phenomenon of moral disagreement, um, well, when people have a moral disagreement, it doesn't seem to be like other types of disagreement. So uh, I might dislike vanilla ice cream and you like vanilla ice cream. And when we have that sort of disagreement in taste, we're fine just saying, okay, well, yeah, whatever, people have different tastes, right? You know, uh, you like vanilla, I dislike vanilla, fine. Um, but if you think about a moral disagreement, well, that's not quite the same. Uh, you know, if I, if I think that abortion is permissible and you think abortion is wrong, well, you know, we're, we're going to have an, uh, probably gonna have an argument about it, um, and I'm going to say things like, you know, it's a like it's a fact that abortion is wrong, or it's true that abortion is wrong. I'm going to assert the proposition that abortion is uh, is 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 wrong, or rather, permissible. That was the way I set up the example. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's, so we we all see the point, right? Um, the point is, uh, it seems like when people engage in moral disagreements, uh, they are presupposing realism, and then maybe that means that realism is the sort of default view, at least. Um, I don't know, is, is that a fair <laughs> summary of this sort of argument? Yeah, there's, there, I think, you know, so there's appeals to moral disagreement. Mm. Uh, there are, of course, there's also appeals to moral disagreement as arguments for anti-realism. So right. there's <laughs> some kind of balancing out there, possibly. Although I do think it's silly to just think, well, if there's an argument for X and against X, they must be equivalent in evidence. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's, you know, there's, this category, I think, would include disagreement, but is this also incorporating, and I'm presuming it does, uh, general semantic considerations? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean... Um... So the fact that structurally murder is wrong has yeah. a propositional structure, that seems, at least uh, on the surface, to weigh against expressivist, non-cognitivist accounts that don't accord it some sort of propositional uh, status. Right. Um, so there's that. Then there's, you know, other sorts of face value claims where it seems like the the claims, and not just in a disagreement context, um, but I, someone might say in an assertoric context or deliberative context, uh, that they they seem to be moral claims seem to be used to state facts. They seem to be used um, to deliberate about what to do and to reason. They seem to figure into arguments, and so yeah. they seem both to have the superficial structure and the superficial function of the sorts of claims about which people appear to be employing them as though they're at at the least propositional. And so we could rule out the non-cognitive stuff. And also some might argue seemingly realist in character, like the types of propositions seem to be describing these stance independent facts. So that would be another element of it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and I think if we, um, so an, another thing to think about is like, if you engage in a moral dispute with somebody, um, you know, like you might, change the other person's mind or they might change your mind and the way that those disputes usually go is quite similar to factual disputes um so you know if if it's so you know if you if you 
like vanilla ice cream and I don't like vanilla ice cream. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going to ch change your mind about that. I'm not going to, like, change your tastes. Um, I mean, maybe I could, but probably not, right? I'm, we're probably not going to just have a conversation and then you end up changing your tastes and disliking vanilla ice cream. Um, whereas, you know, we might well have a conversation about abortion and maybe, you know, I start out thinking that abortion is wrong and you convince me that abortion is permissible. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, like, different things which all seem to, the argument would go, they all seem to sort of have the face value, at least, of being realistic or having realistic presuppositions. Right. I, I think there's more that could be said for these arguments, too. And so one of the, the ways in which I see this framed when it's actually deployed in a way that is rather efficient is in the analysis of claims given particular types of views. And so the, the person that I've seen do this uh, I think the most effectively as a representation of this approach is Mike Humer. And Mike Humer uses this kind of process of elimination approach. So Humer will do this. Humer will say, okay, you've got these five metaethical positions on offer. You've got naturalist and non-naturalist moral realism. And then you've got non-cognitivism, error theory, and relativism. And we could do a semantic analysis of what these claims are under these different sorts of, of views. So if you're a relativist, it would look like you would have to say, um, if it's the case that someone thinks that it's okay to torture babies, uh, then if that person says it's okay to torture babies, then the sentence, it's okay for that person to torture babies, is true. Or if that person says it's okay for me to torture babies, it's true. It actually is good or, or morally permissible for them to torture babies. And then I think humor would say, well, that's absurd. It, it's absurd to think that if a person thinks it's okay to torture babies, then it is for that person to do so. So relativism is absurd. And if you say, well, why is it absurd? At least one of the reasons is that's not how people talk. That's not how they use moral language. No one goes around, you know, if a person encounters a thief in the alleyway and the thief's like, give me your wallet. Uh, and you say no. And they go, uh, <laughs> and then they say, but I think it's morally permissible for me to take your wallet. It would be strange for someone to go, oh, well, I didn't know that you thought it was permissible. In that case, then it is permissible and I don't really have any objection. Here you go. So relativism is absurd. Now, I'm not granting that this is actually a good objection to relativism, but that's the way that that might be analyzed. Uh, and then error theory, error theory would say something like torturing babies for fun is not wrong. Um, that it would say that that statement's true. That's absurd. Of course it's wrong. So error theory is out. And then non-cognitivism, um, that's going to have all these semantic problems when you try to embed it in arguments. It's like right. try to put murder boo into an argument. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it can't even function as a premise. So non-cognitivism is out. And so by process of elimination, we've ruled out error theory, relativism, and non-cognitivism. Realism wins by default. Right. So I've, yep. I've seen humor make that kind of move. Um, and so that's a way that you could use it as not just a burden shifting move, but a straightforward process yep. of elimination where you just say, look, um, the, the, I guess error theory may not have, error theory is not going to have the semantic problems. It's going to have some, it's going to be just counterintuitive, I think. Um, yeah. But it's, it's counterintuitive in that case, at least in virtue I, of I mean, how we would analyze the sentence that would commit you to saying is true. Well, so there's a semantic element to this. I think I think error theory is probably still going to be in conflict with what they take the face value of moral practice to be, though, because um, I mean, you can just so if you just take moral practice at face value, well, you know, we sort of assert various moral claims and uh, we deny others. But, you know, our moral discourse certainly isn't analogous to, you know, witchcraft discourse or, you know, phlogiston discourse where we just don't think that these things exist. Um, so. It, again, like taken at face value, it looks like, OK, well, if I'm saying things like um, abortion is wrong and giving to charity is not wrong um, right. and I'm distinguishing these two things, uh, then uh, maybe there's, yeah, there's some like presupposition that or at least it, it seems at face value like that's in conflict with the idea that just all moral claims are false. Right. Yeah. It would be weird if people were using discourse in a way that did determinately fit with a, a realist analysis, but they weren't in any way committed to or intending to, to mean it that way. And they were actually anti-realist. That would be very strange. It would it would require like what, like everybody is a fictionalist or something. It'd be really, really strange. Um, so it's not going to have that feature. And so, yeah, you could try this process of elimination. You could try burden shifting and, you know, 
there's there's a variety of ways I guess you could leverage these types of considerations. And I think overall, what what they amount to is saying, look, the way that people speak and appear to think about morality sure as hell looks like it, it's indoor, it's supporting realism. Yeah. Um, so okay, uh, what do we think about this argument? Um, I I um. I think I'm probably I, I I would I would be more sympathetic to this than than a, than the Morian shift. Um, so since the, I put the Morian shift in D tier, I, I'd probably put this higher than that. Um, I think that one of the problems I have with this is that the claim about what the face value of moral practice is doesn't seem to me to be very well supported. So um, I mean, this is something that you've talked about a lot so i mean I, I, you probably have more to say about this than i do but it seems like when philosophers make claims about the you know this the supposed face value of moral practice what they're actually talking about is the face value of kind of sentence like moral sentences that are just completely stripped of any context so we're saying like well you know you can consider a claim like murder is wrong and then you can consider um uh we will we will embed that claim in arguments like if murder is wrong then paying someone to murder is wrong murder is wrong therefore paying someone to murder is wrong and i mean it's not really clear that like actually when people make m when people engage in moral discourse that they are asserting these sorts of claims um i think that there's there's a danger of conflating the face value of the moral practice of philosophers, um, which which maybe does sort of fit with this kind of analysis, with the face value of just moral practice in general, right? And I mean, I'm not sure whether that would like. So when we when we appeal to the face value of moral practice, does it make a difference if we uh, are appealing to the face value of uh, philosophers who work in normative ethics versus just ordinary people? Because I could see an argument that, well, the people working in normative ethics are like the, they're, they're the most plausible candidates for being moral experts. So when we, uh, when we appeal to the face value of moral practice, it's really the face value of like professional normative ethics that we should be looking at. Does that, does that make sense? Like, it does, although that would shade this into arguments from expertise or something like that. Yeah, that's um, a good point. And, and I also, I take face value arguments typically to be predicated on the supposed semantic content of ordinary moral language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I that's how I generally, that's how I usually understand them. So maybe we should just stick with that version then. Um, I think yeah, if, if, I, if we're I, making a claim about ordinary moral, moral language, then one issue with this type of argument is that it, it just isn't, it's not obvious really that it's not obvious to me that philosophers um have any of the relevant evidence about what ordinary moral discourse actually looks like um so that might be an issue right so what i should say is that when if i were to apportion the amount of work that i've actually done mm -hmm. on the these different arguments you'll note that i'm not even especially familiar with deliberative indispensability uh this is the this is the particular argument that I've done almost all of my work on. It's effectively uh, sort of in, in a certain ways tangentially, but still very close to what my entire dissertation is on. So my dissertation is on the psychology of metaethics. You could say the psychology of folk metaethics, and what that is that's addressing is the question of, with respect to the question of realism and anti-realism, what do ordinary people think? and how do ordinary people speak? That is what my dissertation is about. And what I end up arguing there is that the particular categories and distinctions in play in contemporary analytic metaethics, this distinction between moral realism and anti-realism is a highly technical, metaphysically loaded and, or conceptually loaded distinction. I mean, there's I say conceptual, you know, as a reference to Scanlon and Parfit, who might want to have a sort of, um, they might want to deflate some of the ontological commitments of realism. Mm -hmm. I don't find that, I don't find that particularly compelling, but I don't find realism compelling. And I, I at least am sympathetic to what they're trying to do. In any case there, uh, in any case, um, so there, there's this, you know, realist project um, of trying to account for ordinary discourse. 
And what I try to do in the dissertation is argue that uh, a lot of the categories and presumptions that philosophers have constructed and the views that have emerged as a, uh, as a contrast to them, the anti-realist positions, are constructions within the, the analytic philosophical tradition that are not reflected in the way that ordinary people think. Um, Michael Gill has a paper on this called Indeterminacy and Variability in Metaethics. I don't remember the exact title, but it's something like that, where Gill makes a comparison to mathematical Platonism. And you could imagine, you know, two people talking about like they're they're adding up the money to to pay for a bill or something or, you know, write, a, write up a tip or something. Um, it would be ridiculous to go, OK, well, the person added three plus four and they got uh, seven. So that person's committed to mathematical Platonism. But it's equally absurd to say that they're committed to anti-Platonism as if they reject Platonism every time they say three and four is seven. That's They're not taking a stance on this. It's just not a feature of ordinary mathematical discourse to take a position on the metaphysical status of mathematical of like numbers. Uh, not, my preferred comparison, that's that's Gill's comparison, and I like it. I think it's a good one. Mine is to take it a bit outside of philosophy, although arguably there's philosophical elements of this, and compare this to quantum mechanics and say that ordinary people, when they make causal claims, yeah, I think it would be absurd to say that they're committed to like the Copenhagen or the many worlds or the, uh, you know, um, like the Bohm interpretation of quantum mechanics whenever they say, like, I think it's going to rain tomorrow. And I think that the same applies in the case of metaethics. I don't think that a commitment to these weird philosophical positions is a feature of ordinary moral discourse. And so I take an extreme view as far as I, I've never heard of anybody else defending this, but I argue for a kind of near global metaethical indeterminacy where I argue that virtually no non-philosophers actually have, or th I don't think they speak, think, or act in ways consistent with any particular metaethical position. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't have anybody endorsing that, but I try to make a case for that. Um, at the very least, what I can say is that there, so if you take a step back from that, there's this important problem that I have with the, the discourse, which is this, this area of, of work, descriptive metaethics. What is the, the content of ordinary moral thought and language? Uh, there's something puzzling about this. And I spoke with Don Loeb about this um, recently, which is, is this an empirical question or not? Because if this is not an empirical question, I'm not sure what kind of question it's supposed to be. Like we're trying to figure out um, the meaning of ordinary moral claims but we're not concerned with what people are trying to do when they actually use moral claims. What? I, I, so there's something there, but if it is an empirical question, okay, so let's let, so if the former, then I think it's going to rely on a conception of language and meaning that I'm probably going to reject. And then I'm going to reject like pr pretty aggressively. Like I think that there's, there's just something very strange about these anti-empirical approaches. Um, but if it is making an empirical claim, the empirical evidence just is not there to sustain any sort of claim that ordinary people speak or think in a way consistently like moral realists. It's just that's not what the evidence suggests. So uh, if it's not an empirical claim, I don't know what kind of claim it is. If it isn't, and I think it's going to have serious problems. If it is an empirical claim, the evidence doesn't support it. Um, so on the other hand, that's not an easy case to make. So... Does that count in favor of it? That it's tough to refute it, um, right? No. So I guess I guess I've said a lot there, but basically, um, I'll just say briefly what the empirical evidence suggests. So there is empirical research on how people use these claims. What you get is a absolute mess. It's not clear whether participants are interpreting questions in the way researchers intend, and this is part of the reason I appeal to. I think the best explanation for this is that they don't have the conceptual distinctions to respond meaningfully to the questions in the way that the researchers want. And I think that the interpretations that they have are completely reasonable, but they just don't fit with the philosophical categories. Um, that's my take on most of the literature. What I will say though, and this is something I'm fond Sorry, of pointing out. Sorry, just um, clarify. When you say, um, the, you said they don't respond to the questions in the way that researchers want, uh, what would be an example of one of these questions? Oh, sure. Say? Okay, so let's say a researcher asks a participant whether they think, they, they say, hey, do you think whether murder is right or wrong is, there's an objectively true answer to that question. And a person says, yes, I do. Does that mean the person's a realist? Right. Well, if you're operationalizing it at, at, as a measure of realism, then that person would have to inter interpret murder is wrong is objectively true to mean it's a stance independent moral fact that murder is wrong. But when you actually ask people hey, if we were to say murder is objectively wrong, what does it mean to say it's objective? Um, my own research on this, I did ask people questions like this, and they will not typically say anything. Of course, they don't have the technical language most of the time. And if they do, it's questionable whether they even count 
as a non-philosopher, because at the very least, if they can respond to the question in a way that is philosophically informed, are they a non-philosopher? They might not have a degree in philosophy, but they have training in philosophy. So, uh, you know, uh, it's it's now, I mean, this is already, I address this, but there's a continuum between someone being more of a philosopher and less of a philosopher. It's not like I have magical philosopher particles in me or something that they don't have. So, you know, even if we rule out people that do have technical knowledge, they're not going to have the technical language, but they could at least say something like, yeah, it means that whether it's right or wrong isn't, it's, we don't make it true, or it doesn't depend on us, or it's not true based on our culture, or it's not down, it's not a matter of preference. There's a lot of ways of, that are pretty straightforward and like ordinary language-ish to convey that idea that they don't need the technical language. But that's not typically what people say. They say a whole bunch of other stuff. A lot of times people understand objectivity to mean that there is some sort of clear and distinct answer. So it's a kind of epistemic interpretation. Um, sometimes they interpret it to mean that the judgment is made in an unbiased way. That is a reasonable interpretation of objective, but it's not the intended one. And so those are just a couple examples. There are other ways of measuring people's beliefs about moral realism and anti-realism, and they run into similar sorts of problems. People routinely interpret the questions that are intended to measure their views about meta-ethics as epistemic questions or normative questions about what their moral their normative moral position is or some sort of other like a very common one when you give people questions about moral disagreements you say hey two people disagree about a moral issue can they both be correct and if they say yes that's supposed to be relativism but if you ask people why they could both be correct they might say things and they, they often do as a matter of fact say things like well they're thinking of different moral situations one in which the action would be justified and one in which it wouldn't mm -hmm. You know, so if you say two people disagree about whether stealing is, is wrong, can they both be correct? And a person says yes. And you say, well, why do you think they could both be correct? Someone might say, well, one person thinks it's okay to steal medicine, which it is, like to save your family. And the other thinks it's okay to steal just for fun or greed. And that's not okay. And they could both be right about that. Oh, okay, but that's that's not relativism. That's just two different moral issues in the same broader category. So these are the kinds of responses you get for these sorts of questions. And what these are, these are reasonable interpretations of... The, the question. It's not obvious to people when you ask a question about moral disagreement that you're asking them to consider it, the, a disagreement about exactly the same moral issue in exactly the same context in exactly the same way. They're not trained as philosophers to, to recognize the context of the question you're asking in order to appreciate that that's what you're going for. So yeah, this is a problem with the research. Um, the, yeah, okay. Um, so it seems like the... Well, yeah, where does that leave us then? So it seems like the the sort of positive claim about what the face value of moral practice actually looks like is um, maybe not that well supported. Uh, on, on the other hand, you know, we also don't really have much support for an alternative claim, right? We just sort of don't really know at the moment. That That's kind of right. where we are. But I want to make two other points on that. One of them is that what I take to be the best design study is a study by Pulsar and Wright. It's called Anti-Realist Pluralism. Mm -hmm. And what they did in that study, so Pulsar and Wright have been at the forefront of identifying the methodological problems I'm referencing. So I've done work on this. Uh, Pulsar and Wright have done work on this. And we've all worked to point out and identify these methodological problems. But they've done a lot of the work to try to preserve this method of giving people moral disagreements and then seeing how they evaluate them to see whether they're realist or anti-realist. They've done pretty much all of the work to try to, well, uh, James Beebe has done some work too um, with forced choice problems. So other people have done work on this too. So I take that back. Uh, so other people have worked on this as well. But they did this study, came out in 2020, where they, they sort of systematically attempt to mitigate or eliminate as many of the methodological problems that they've identified or that other people have identified as possible. And then on top of that, to try to train the participants to understand the relevant conceptual distinctions so that they could respond meaningfully. And then on top of that, the response options that they give them for the questions, they're a lot more carefully worded to avoid ambiguities and inflations and misunderstandings. And so they attempt to do their very best to make sure that the participants interpret what they're asking the way they're intending to. And they probably have some degree of success with that. That creates a different problem. Um, but what, when they did that, uh, they ran the, when they ran these studies, they had Set, uh, about 75% of the participants across, I think, seven different paradigms. There's there's quite a few different ways they measure. So they use like seven different measures, I think, or we could just say a bunch of them, nearly 10. And they had about three quarters of the participants give consistently anti-realist responses. Right. So the best design study gets mostly anti-realist. Uh, do I think that means most people in the world are anti-realists? No, because I don't know whether the participants were caused to be anti-realists by being trained 
in the purpose of the study, like in the context of the study, which I call spontaneous theorizing. Yeah. Um, could be, in other words, they weren't real anti-realists. You brought them in the study, you explain a bunch of stuff to them that they never thought about. They thought about it and then they became anti-realists. Mm -hmm. So they're in a certain sense novice philosophers and that no longer has the the external validity. You can't, you can't, in other words, extrapolate from what they thought after training to what people think outside of the context of the study. For the same reason, if I put you through a crash course in quantum mechanics, you come to adopt the many worlds interpretation and then like 90% of my students do that I can't then say 90% of the world's population are many worlds proponents. That's right. ridiculous. They didn't have training in quantum mechanics. So you have that problem. Um, the other problem with that is that there's demographic issues. I don't wanna get into too much detail, but I'll just say um, the participants were drawn from college students in the US. College students are disproportionately likely to be anti-realist according to other studies, BB and Sacris, um, moral relativism across the lifespan, I think is the paper. And then um, there's also research on the demographic characteristics of people that do online surveys through Amazon's Mechanical Turk in the United States. And they're way more likely than the general public in the US to be atheists and agnostics and atheists and agnostics are more likely to be anti-realist. And so they drew on two populations that were disproportionately likely to give high rates of anti-realist responses. And so the study has low generalizability to the rest of the world's population. So that's all I'll say on that. The best available study had very high anti-realist relate rates, but low generalizability. So again, I guess, that gets us back where we started, we don't really know. But I, the last point I wanted to make is not about all the research. So I'm done with that because I, I, I'm i saying too much about it because that's that's what I do. I love that stuff so much. Um, the last thing I'll say is I just reject at the outset that morality has that much of this surface appearance of being realist in the first place. So you point to disagreements. Okay, but you know you might say, well, people disagree and they make all these arguments and it looks realist. People disagree or people argue. I And I bet if you did a corpus analysis and you looked online, like on social media, People argue about whether movies are good, whether food is good, whether books are good, whether, you know, all kinds of things are good, about which I suspect yeah. they are very much not realist about those well, things. Well, so, 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 it sounds like you've got a good argument for the face value of aesthetic realism there. <laughs> like, uh, so, I, but that's not the move I would make. What I would make, the, I, I would point yeah. out, it, there. I mean, a couple things, which is that people argue for fun. Yeah. They're not always, and they're not always trying to, demonstrate what's true. And the other thing is a lot of arguments center on coordination problems, not so much on determining what's true. So if you and I are negotiating, like I'm trying to buy something from you and you're trying to sell something, I want the lowest price, you want the highest price. There's not a fact of the matter about the correct price. We just have competing interests. And mm -hmm. if we're arguing about the price, we don't have to think, nor would I think it make much sense to suppose that there is a fact of the matter about the correct price. It's just a question of what we'll both agree to. And so arguments often occur in contexts about which it would be ridiculous to think there's a fact of the matter. It's just a, a, a clash of, uh, it's a coordination problem of, yeah. uh, clash of values. So this is, this is an important distinction between the case of argument, like moral arguments on the one hand, and then a, say a disagreement in taste with respect to vanilla ice cream, right? So I, I mentioned, you know, you like vanilla ice cream. I don't like vanilla ice cream. We're not going to argue about it, but probably the reason why we wouldn't argue about it is just that it sort of doesn't matter, right? It doesn't make any difference if you want to eat vanilla ice cream and I don't. Well, okay, who cares? Whereas, you know, if, if what, like, if I want to live in a world where abortion is accessible and you want to live in a world where, like, there's no killing of fetuses, now, with, now there's a conflict. Like, now we kind of have to have a discussion just in order to like come to some sort of compromise in order to like decide, well, what are we actually going to do? All right. Is this going to be something that we allow or not? Um, so it, it certainly, and, and yeah, like you say, I mean, people actually do argue about all sorts of things that uh, they're not realists. I'm certainly not an aesthetic realist, but I'm happy to argue about, you know, movies, uh, music, right? Like, and I'll, I might well, convince another person to uh, that, that you know there's something worthwhile in some movie or they might convince me you know like I have changed my mind about some of these things as a result of discussions with other people um, so yeah I don't I don't find this argument very convincing either <laughs> yeah I mean uh, and then one final point that I guess is more in line with sort of less unconventional stuff than like my weird metaphysical <laughs> indeterminacy is if you're a constructivist or a cultural relativist, you can disagree with other people too. You could yeah. disagree. You could disagree about what the constructivist procedure you both agree to, what the output of it is. So two people that are both saying, "Hey, we want to employ the principles that we would agree to behind a veil of ignorance," 
Um, you could disagree on what people would agree to behind a veil of ignorance. That doesn't mean you think there's an objective fact of the matter that's independent of people's stances. It's just that you disagree on what the collective of people's stances would result in. So yeah, the constructive yeah. Same with cultural relativists. So two people, could, one person could say, you know, we, you know, this action is consistent with the standards of our culture. And someone could say, no, it's not. You're living in the past. Mm -hmm. Society has moved on. Society's changed. And actually, most people are against it now. So it's not OK. And you think it is. I don't know if I said it was OK or not yeah. OK, but the reverse of whatever the other person mm -hmm. said. And so two people that are both they could both be indexing their claims to the same framework, uh, you know, they're not moral realists, and yet they disagree. So just pointing to this this surface structure is not a good way to show right. that people are realists. I mean, and the, sa the same will actually be true with respect to first order moral claims, because you could have two people who are just utilitarians. You know, they just sort of have a, let's say they're non-cognitivists. They just approve of maximizing happiness. Obviously, you can disagree about what's going to maximize happiness. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of it could get offloaded onto the non-moral facts. Um, so Okay, then. So, yeah, where is this one going to go? Um, I, I, this I think... is the hardest one to rate. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that this is this should go above D tier because I think it's better than the Morian shift. Um, so, uh, now... Wait, where, was the, where did the Morian shift go? Morian shift was in D. Um, so, and then we have... Uh, companions in guilt and phenomenal conservatism in C. is it better than those um hmm i f i would be inclined i'm i'm inclined to say no uh i don't think it is um i'm actually so do we so we have one option which is to put it also in c and we still have yeah. i think b is still empty or we might have to bump those up to a b and I'm I'm, I'm inclined to bump phenomenal conservatism up to a B. Uh, I, okay, I, and then I, what about companions and guilt? I'm happy with that in, to remain in, in C. Um, so then, you think phenomenal conservatism is better than companions and guilt? Oh, this is so difficult though, because because phenomenal conservatism, as I said, it has this it backfires, right? Because because right. if I apply phenomenal conservatism, I just end up with more justification for anti-realism. Ah. Uh, Damn, this is tricky. Um, am I going to have to bump Companions and Guilt up? Oh, I don't really want to put Companions and Guilt in B. I might have to. You could just have three things in the C category. It doesn't have, have to things. be a B. You know what? You're right. So, okay, are you are you all right putting face value argument in uh, in C? Yeah, it does. It So uh, it's a good middle zone for me. Uh, what I'll say about it is I think I present really good arguments against it, but those arguments require a ridiculous amount of work, and I don't think it's unreasonable. <laughs> to think that if, if if a whole lot of work has to go into showing why something's wrong, there's a, a reasonable chance that from an outside view, something has gone wrong in my arguments. Yes. But but there's, there's, there's a couple of steps here, though, because even if we were to accept the claim about the face value, that so there's people disagree. So let's say that, yeah, people ah, are... Oh, right, right I forgot all about facts, this. Then... Then, I mean, there's this whole other question of, well, yeah, but maybe, as we already said, maybe they're disagreeing because they're just both utilitarians or whatever. Like, you could account for it in that way. Um, but there's and, a deeper problem, then, which we, I thought you were going to say this. Yeah. And I, maybe you will. <laughs> I, I mean... The problem is that even if we grant that the face value, how good of a reason is that to think that right, realism is exactly. true? <laughs> yeah. And I don't think it's a particularly good reason. It might seem at face... Like, look, a lot of people believe in God. A lot of people have superstitious beliefs. Um, there's all sorts of good reasons to think that human cognition may be structured in ways where we're sensitive to patterns that aren't really there. Uh, so I'm not, I don't put a whole lot of stock in general human capacity for reasoning well. Yeah. So, um, so this is, yeah, that's like the big thing is that, well, I mean, you could go back to the 1600s and the face value practice of witchcraft discourse was realist, right? But I don't know, was that a good reason back then to believe in witches? Um, doesn't seem like it would have been. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think, I think it's a pretty weak argument. I still think, though, it's, I do think it's better than the Morian shift, because at least there's some, you know, with the Morian shift, you're just, it's just, it's just like saying, well, this is more plausible, right? Why? Well, at least there's some explanation for Yeah, yeah, why, this yeah. has an explanation. This has got to be better than Morian shift. 
But then the only question is where it stands in relation to companions at guilt and phenomenal conservatism. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to just sort of put it. I, I, I feel like if I'm being honest, I, I, I should probably say that companions and guilt is, is better. I think it's probably a better argument. So um, do you want to, so we could bump companions and guilt up to B and then keep phenomenal conservatism and face value in C. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's going to have to be that way, isn't it? All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it. That's what I'm doing. Okay. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. So, um, okay then. Well, um, we got, we got three left. Um, so the next, the next one is the expertise argument, um, which is, well, basically the idea uh, here is relatively simple. Um, in general, uh, you should defer to expert consensus, right? So if if most of the experts, if most of the people who have expertise on a given issue believe that P, then you should, that gives you some good reason also to believe that P, um, because these are people who have thought about the issue very carefully. Uh, they have, you know, a great deal of knowledge about it. They're able to assess the arguments and the evidence, etc. Um so in general, you should trust experts. Now, when it comes to moral realism, the relevant experts are going to be people who are trained in metaethics. Uh, so professional philosophers who specialize in metaethics. And the cons there is a m moderate consensus, not, not anything close to a universal consensus, but there is, you know, it, like most professional philosophers do lean towards moral realism. I, I think among metaethicists, it's something like 69%. Um, I, I can I can give the numbers if you okay. want. Yeah, well, let's hear the numbers then. Yeah, so the the source first is the 2020 Phil Paper survey. It was a survey sent out um, to a bunch of philosophers, mostly those working within the analytic tradition. There's probably a few other characteristics of who they sent the surveys to. Uh, they had, it was like, what, 1,785 respondents, something like that. Uh, I think most of them answered the question about realism or anti-realism. This is across all specializations. Mm -hmm. Uh, the percentage that fit, that leaned towards or accepted moral realism was 62% for the 2020 uh, Phil Paper survey. If you focus just on the those that specialize in metaethics, which I believe was 228 of them, which I think comprised 13% of the total respondents, something around there, uh, it went up to about 65%. So it went up a small amount, but it did go up. Yeah. So you get 62% in general and then 65% for specialists. Okay. Um, right. So, oh, and I, I mean, with the uh, moral and moral anti-realism is something like 25%. So it's not 60, it's not like 65% moral realism and 35% anti-realism. It's right. It's like 65% realism, 25% anti-realism. And then other people are yeah, just with, in between. It's something like that. Yeah, that's right. So in the general amount, I think it's 26% anti-realist. I don't remember what percentage there is under just the specialists in meta ethics. Um, but yeah, you have a large proportion. So this is a philosophy survey. So they give lots of alternative options, which were typically things like both, neither, some other view, you know, often a whole bunch of, of unusual views. So you'll often get like eight people said one thing, three people said another thing, two people said this other thing, one person said another, and another person said another one. And so you get this, this big category of everything else. And that everything else category, I think was like 14% or something. I don't even know if the numbers quite add up. And one thing to note about this is sometimes the percentages on those surveys are higher than 100% because people can pick more than one. Yeah. For so I, I don't know if that was true for all of the questions, but it, it is true for some of them, because if you look, the percentages will add up like the 120%. So right. they definitely, you know, they definitely weren't just picking one. Uh, but yeah, it it's about, I, I would say roughly it's it's two thirds people favor realism and one, one quarter favor anti-realism. And okay. then the rest are somewhere in between. Yeah, so okay, we have a majority favoring uh, favoring realism. When you look at the experts, uh, a majority favor realism, and so given that you should generally defer to uh, what the experts say, you have some reason to think that realism um, is true. All right, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this. Um, I think that this is a deeply unconvincing argument. Uh, I, I mean, if, if anything goes into the, the E tier, I, I'd, be, I'd probably be inclined to put this one in there. Um, 
Yeah, I. So, I think for, so. First of all, um, when we're talking about like deferring to expert consensus, uh, okay, for, like so. In in general, this idea of deferring to expert consensus that seems like it's uh, it, even if you were to accept that. I'm just not sure that like what we have right here is anything close to being enough of a consensus. I mean, you know, it's not like what you have in the case of climate change, for instance, where it's like, you know, I mean, 97, I think it's actually a lot higher than 97% now. Um, so it might be like, you know, 99.5% of climate scientists agree on climate change. Um, when it comes to, um, <laughs> when it comes to, uh, Meta ethics, though, it's it's like sixty five twenty seven. I, I, I mean, OK, so but there's a sig there's a significant portion of um, of so-called experts who, who just disagree. Um, now, the other problem here is that there's different ways of being a moral realist. So whether or not you have a consensus is kind of it's going to look it's going to depend on like how you taxonomize these different positions um so you know we have moral non-naturalism and moral naturalism is like the big distinction between different types of realists and it really isn't clear i mean so what like there might be somebody who is a moral naturalist um but like if you were to ask them uh, okay, like if if it turns out that like the naturalist reduction of moral norms doesn't work, uh, would they then become moral non-naturalists? Well, no, maybe they would just become erotheorists or something. Um, similarly, you know, like there might be moral non-naturalists who like their second best option would be some sort of anti-realism. I mean, um, so I, I I'm not really sure that like yeah that they they all so there's a group of people who are like 65 percent of people will say moral realism, um, but like those moral realisms involve very very different commitments right the commitments of a moral naturalist might be very different so the the, the metaphysics the epistemology um, is going to be very different whether you're, you know whether you're talking about like Richard Boyd, on the one hand, who's a Cornell realist, or uh, someone like Michael Huber, who's a non-naturalist, right? It's like, so, I, I mean, I, I'm just not sure that I would count that as a consensus in any relevant sense, because, it, you know, it, to me, like, a consensus should be, like, if I look at climate science, um, there, there seems to be a broad agreement about, like, the, the entities that are being postulated, and then how you find out about how those about what those entities are doing and how they work um there is no such agreement when it comes to meta ethics um that there's at least among realists uh so i'm skeptical that the that, that consensus even exists in the way that would be required for this argument to even get off the ground um that's one point yeah uh just to give people that are hearing us talking about this, some data, that same survey, the 2020 field paper survey, also asked the philosophers responding to it to endorse the particular meta-ethical position that they favored. Uh -huh. And you have a roughly even split between naturalists and non-naturalists. I pulled up the data right here. So you have about, if we're, I'm just gonna round up. So we have about 27% non-naturalists and then about 32% naturalist realists. And so it is very nearly split with a slight uh, uh, leaning towards naturalist accounts. Um, so yeah, it is evenly split. So it's not like we go and look and it's only 5% naturalists and, you know, 55 or whatever percent realists, uh, sorry, non-naturalist realists. That might be still, you could say, okay, well, at least it's a little more than half. We don't have any particular position that's more than half. And one thing I think is kind of funny about this is that non-naturalists in particular will often tout the consensus in favor of their view, but their view at 26.56% is almost identical to the number of anti-realists, which is like 26.1% or something like that. So slightly lower, but the numbers are almost the same. So there's not that, so there are approximately as many, and this, this is a matter of like maybe less than 10 people responding to the survey. If you look at the specialists, um, for the number of philosophers responding to the survey that favored non-naturalist realism versus anti-realism. And it's not at all clear. There are certain ways in which naturalists have affinities or, or like there's a sort of more in common between naturalist realists and anti-realists 
uh, in some ways than there is relative to non-naturalists. So, you know, I, I would actually bet most anti-realists are going to be are going to be favored favorable towards, if not naturalism more broadly, like a naturalist philosophical perspective in general, then the kind of sparse ontological perspectives that you and I might favor. Like, I don't even think we have the same view, but we both have the kind of um, what Don Loeb called it a fondness for desert landscapes. Mm -hmm. Like we want to keep as much crap out of our ontology as we can. Um, and so and there's various ways of doing that. You have like the various monistic views, uh, skeptical views, pragmatist views. So there's a bunch of ways where you could rule this uh, stuff out. I'm not saying pragmatism necessarily entails mm -hmm. that this, it, it's, it's, there's just a variety of options here that are not, I'm buying into the non-naturalist stuff of like mainstream analytic philosophies, super duper love of really baroque metaphysics yeah. like there's a whole category of people that reject that it's one thing i find weird when people argue against physicalism is that they take it if you're not a physicalist and you have to endorse uh whatever weird <laughs> dualist or weird metaphysical view as if i don't have any other options yeah. um so it's the same thing here um so that's that's one point is that 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 position is a kind of pseudo consensus and I actually thought of a comparison that I don't know how well it will work because I just thought of it now. So maybe it'll just sound weird. But imagine you imagine we're talking about the origin of life on Earth. And there are three competing accounts of how life arose on Earth, which is that it arose uh, through biological evolution and a, like we'll just say abiogenesis. It arose by abiogenesis, by aliens deliberately seeding Earth with life and designing humans um, like a really it's not like they just threw some some bacteria here. They designed humans. Uh, aliens design humans or God made us. Right, right. And if you compared the three positions, it would be really weird for some. So someone could have the we were created view mm -hmm. as a super category and say both the aliens made us and God made us. And then that let's say that was like 60 percent or 65 percent. It would be weird for those two groups to unify and then say that we were created view wins out. There's a consensus yeah. we were created relative to the organic view, because in many ways, the aliens put us here. If those people say, look, aliens put us here and let us be very explicit. It definitely wasn't God. There is no supernatural. We only believe in a natural world. And it definitely super duper wasn't God. It was some natural process. And if you say, OK, well, what if we, we proved it wasn't aliens? They go, oh, well, then it must have been abiogenesis. So those people have a lot in common with the abiogenesis people that they don't have in common with the, with the God did it people. It's weird to treat them as the same category. So I don't know if that comparison. If yeah, you find yeah that, no, that, that's how I mean, that totally makes sense, because so. I think that a, like a moral naturalist could say, well, you know, look, uh, I don't believe in irreducible normativity, like irreducible normativity. Yeah, I totally agree with Mackie. That's just queer or that's unintelligible or whatever. Like, so I, I don't get on board with any of that weird metaphysics. Um, and then like, what's my epistemology? Well, I think that we can establish that there are these naturalistic moral facts through you know, inference to the best explanation. We can use the same sorts of methods that are used in the empirical sciences to come to a to, to moral beliefs. So someone like that, uh, you know, like if if you were to sort of tell that person, well, actually, naturalist realism isn't going to work. Um, would they, you know, would would they just convert to non naturalism, or would they say, ah, oh, well, I guess you know, it sucks, but it looks like I'm going to have to be an anti realist now. Um, I think a you know a not all of them, but a lot of them would probably kind of shift in the more anti-realist direction in that case. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't see a consensus here in the sense that would be required uh, for, for this to work. Like, cause, cause it's like, well, OK, what, what am I supposed to be believing in? Right. Like when, when you say that there's this consensus for moral realism. Um, so uh, am I supposed to believe in irreducible objective moral norms or am i supposed to believe in these naturalistic moral properties like yeah what? to draw the analogy <laughs> be like if someone's like look we were created it's just a question of whether aliens did it or god did it those are very different proposals why would i endorse the ah it's just i know we were created it's just a question of aliens or god that's that's strange because the, the reasons why i would favor one or the other are so different treating it as a kind of placeholder it's like an undifferentiated position it's undifferentiated between two accounts that are so different from one another it's unclear why you would be motivated by the the super category itself yes um, the, the motivations for the aliens did it or god did it are so independent of one another it would be weird for someone to say look i know it's one of the two unless like unless they have this really 
strong reasons for rejecting, and maybe some, I think some would, would say, look, I know it's not abiogenesis. That's just nonsense. So there's probably some people that would just say, that's so implausible that if God doesn't exist, then it had to be aliens. Of course, you got to oh, yeah. where the hell the aliens come from. I, know, I mean, but, there could be a scientific consensus that, um, that actually that's the case, right? Like they, it, we, could, we can imagine some scientific consensus emerging that like, well, humans just, well, like life on Earth just must have been designed. Um, you know, this actually just couldn't have arisen through an abi. In the same way, I suppose it's possible that there could uh, emerge a consensus in philosophy that uh, anti-realism just like it can't work for some reason. Like there's just some knockdown right. problem for anti. But that consensus does not exist. There, there. You know, like different philosophers have different objections to anti-realism. Um, there's no unifying consensus about what's wrong with it so yeah right we shouldn't we shouldn't omit either that it's it might very well be the case that some non-naturalists would say the naturalist project is so ridiculous that yeah. if it's not non-naturalism it's anti-realism i bet quite a few would say that actually yeah, yeah and I, so I, I, if, I've if you them. if you like <laughs> I, yeah, i've heard at least a couple yeah. say that so that's what i'm basing that on but I, I don't have like survey data it would be interesting to do a rank order if this one isn't true which one would be the next one if this one's not true <laughs> which one's the next one and to see where people get. My guess is that anti-realism would be choice number two for choice number one or two for most people. Although we should be careful not to do what the realists just because I mean there are different anti-realists, right? This error theory, constructivism, true. you know, non -cognitive. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. So this might be really hard to rank order. So you might have to break them down further because you know I suspect a lot of them would be okay. Look, I'm okay with the with error theory but I'm sure as hell not okay with non-cognitivism. Yeah. And I was going to say, I think relativism would be the lowest on the list. I think everybody Probably. hates relativism. Yeah. And I also think constructivism would do modestly well. I think a lot of people would take that as a compromise position. So yeah. I, I think you would have this interesting list where it would be like naturalist realism, non -nat naturalist realism or non-naturalist realism would be the most popular um, or anti-realism, some type of, sorry, um, it's going to be one of those. Then I think that expressivism and error theory are going to do reasonably well. I actually think expressivism, and I think this is consistent with Phil Paper's data, maybe this is why I'm saying this, would outperform the other anti-realist positions. I was really surprised that error theory was so low because er error theory's got, I, th I think it's like 5% or something. It, it might even be low. I'm looking at it now. It's 5.27%, yeah. okay. yeah. whereas expressivism gets 106 I think the reason why is that expressivist accounts have really done their best to hybridize in a way that's really conciliatory towards realist positions. So you've got quasi-realism and stuff. Um, and I think that has it has inflated its appeal. Mm -hmm. You know, if it this was just straight up like AJ or emotivism versus error theory, I think error theory would win. The way, the way it should have stayed, really the way it should have been uh, before they went off on the wrong track, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that's what I would say, but because um, yeah. I, I quite like what Ayer has to say and what Hare has to say. I don't I don't endorse the positions outright, but I think they've been given short shrift. And I think the, the dispensing with them was, I think, premature and based on reasons I don't find particularly compelling. Um, we're sort of going a little bit off track here. <laughs> uh, oh, so, that's true. Okay, um, so. The expertise argument. <laughs> yeah. yeah, expertise argument. Yeah. So I actually, I should say, I currently have an ongoing blog series on the blog, Lens Independent, called The Phil Papers Fallacy. And the whole point of the blog series is to argue that we shouldn't put that much stock in what a majority of philosophers endorse or reject, as far as arguments go. And the whole thing is is based on raising a whole bunch of reasons why we should be not very confident. So I'll just summarize, because I, I know I've said a lot when I get into the empirical stuff, I just tend to go like talking for, like, for 20 minutes. The basic idea is this. If you look at the demographics of the respondents to the survey, I think 48% are from the United States. The vast majority, though, are in countries with particular demographic characteristics. These are weird countries, Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, democratic. Empirical research shows that psychologically speaking, people from these kinds of countries, this is the United States, the UK, Australia, uh, Canada, and then to a lesser extent, uh, you know, there's it, there's going to be a gradation of the degree to which weird influences and, and, and subsets of that, like democracy, industrialization, that sort of thing, have made their way around the world. But there's this sort of cluster of countries that exhibit these particular traits on average within the populations to a very high degree. Um, those populations, empirical research has shown, are psychologically idiosyncratic relative to the rest of the world's population. 
And most of the respondents to the survey are from those populations, work within those populations, and write and speak and do all their work in English, which is the sort of most prototypical, it's like the exemplar language of weird society. And so the whole point is you have a population of people that make up only about 12% of the world's population. And already there's a lot of empirical research showing they're not psychologically very similar to everybody else. And then these people um, are analyzing English sentences and the judgments and experiences that they've had of themselves and their colleagues interacting with people in predominantly the United States. And then they're extrapolating from that from how humans in, in general think. And that I think is highly questionable. And then there's other uh, issues. I'll just mention one briefly, which is that uh, if we're going to look at the consensus among experts, well, there are these things, self-selection effects. And so that same 2020 Phil Paper survey, if you look at philosophers in general, most of them are atheists. I don't know, 70, 80 percent, something like that. So it's mostly atheists. Um, but then if you look at philosophers that specialize in philosophy of religion, it flips. It's actually mostly theists. And it almost exactly flips in the opposite direction. Uh, does that mean that because most specialists in philosophy of religion are theists, that this is really good evidence that theism is true? I, I take it not. And there's an obvious reason why. People that are disposed to believe in God are more likely to study philosophy of religion. Now, I think that this is almost certainly true. Just the same, you could imagine that people that are disposed towards the kinds of views that would incline them towards anti-realism might, one, not be particularly disposed towards studying meta-ethics, and then two, might not be so disposed towards studying philosophy in general. It could be that the kinds of... Um, broadly skeptical or anti-realist positions that people might be inclined towards would discourage those people from pursuing careers in analytic philosophy because uh, analytic philosophy, the, the positive positions within the field tend to take these more um, like ontologically profligate stances on what the world is like. And someone with a very sparse ontology might not be very interested in, it, in joining a field where they have to say, that's not real, that's not real, that's not real. Just like, you know, a, you're not going to find too many cryptozoologists that are convinced there's no cryptids. They'd be really weird. What if, They're going to yeah. run around looking for Bigfoot and I'm convinced there's no Bigfoot? What, why would they do that? I mean, they might, and there probably are a couple, but they're not going to be the most, the per, people that think Bigfoot's real are more likely to pursue Bigfoot. So, yeah, and I think I, the same thing. I wonder if the, uh, if the realists might say, well, you know, if we look at, like just the last uh, hundred years of philosophy. So like, you know, the development of analytic philosophy, it seems to be the case, although we don't have any, uh, I don't think we have any survey data like the Phil Papers surveys, but it, it does seem to be the case that anti-realism, moral anti-realism uh, was the consensus for some time. Like, so from, you know, like during the sort of like the logical positivists up to about the 1970s, it seems like, um, people were mostly anti-realists back then um and so it, i don't know i mean i guess they, they could say well the fact that you had mostly anti-realists in analytic philosophy and then it kind of gradually shifted from you know like the 60s and 70s you started seeing this resurgence of realism maybe that would go some way towards allaying this concern that there's just something about the analytic methods that um like it's it's people who are more inclined to realism would be more attracted to those methods or something like that. Yeah, I think I, I think that you raise a good point there, which is that uh, if analytic methodology were systematically inclining people towards realism or anti-realism, then we wouldn't expect that kind of change within the field. Um, I hadn't considered that, and I think that's a good point, and I think it should lower my confidence that there's something fundamentally wrong with the method. Um, on the other hand. Uh, one could see that within the tradition uh, itself that there was a development of the tradition. So you have the kind of linguistic turn. And then I, I see what, you, look, you had Wittgenstein, which, who had an enormous influence in ordinary language philosophy. And you had these kind of anti-metaphysical approaches that I see as, uh, you know, and I'm not a historian of philosophy, but I see them largely as a reaction to an attempt and an attempt to graft the successes of the sciences onto philosophy and really get something out of that. And I think that part of part of the, the sort of um, side effect or even constitutive of that is a highly anti-metaphysical uh, approach to philosophy. But one could see the return of realism as a kind of reorienting around the natural disposition of philosophy as a, a sort of um, autonomous discipline. So I think that as philosophy has moved towards carving out it, 
like, you know, you, it used to be in the past that these fields were a lot more amorphous. It was a lot more nebulous what you were and how you did things. You have natural philosophy. But if philosophy is going to remain a functionally autonomous and distinct discipline, it needs to have its own methodological territory and it needs to have its own space of problems. And while you had these types of approaches to philosophy, positivism, ordinary language philosophy, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, and this, th some of this continued on after that, that want to extirpate and purge much of what is central to the philosophical corpus, though, I mean, I, I suspect that it's not the case that um, that trend of shifting away from that and back towards uh, moral naturalism and then eventually moral non-naturalism, which I think was a wave that came a little bit later, more recently, maybe in the 90s, um, that though those are sort of um, a self-correction towards the intrusion of a kind of anti-philosophical mindset within the field that I think is innervating and discouraging. I mean, Wittgenstein literally would tell people, like, don't do philosophy, quit and go do something else. And so a lot of those people, I suspect, did. A lot, like, I mean, keep in mind also, this was a few decades into the emergence of psychology, and you had, uh, you know, look, you had psychology emerging, what, in the late 1800s, but look around the same time, you have the rise and the, the sort of uh, behaviorism. Again, I'm speculating off the cuff with a lot of historical speculation here where the, the, the details are going to be wrong, I'm not sure about everything, but psychology stepped onto the scene. Look what I ended up doing my discipline in, uh, my, sorry, my research in. I ended up in a psychology program. And so people with my kind of hyper empirical disposition, there's a good chance that they ended up in linguistics programs, cognitive science programs, um, and other sorts of programs where they, the people with those inclinations left. And so I do think that sociologically something complicated has gone on here. But I think that the, that the fact that, so it might not be that philosophy has selected four people with these inclinations so much as the entire academic uh, like world has selected those people towards other directions. I think something funny is going on here. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose it is worth noting that when I say, you know, there are, there are all these, more, it was mostly moral anti-realists and then there was a resurgence of moral realism around the sort of 60s and 70s. Well, at the same time, there were significant changes in analytic philosophy in general, and there was a resurgence of more, well, there was a resurgence of metaphysics in general, following people yeah. like Kripke. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's not, it's not just, the change didn't just happen in meta-ethics. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so, I, I, I well, um, d d is there anything else to say about this one, then, the expertise argument? Um, yeah, I, there's a couple I, other I things to I, say. There was... There was one more so one more point i definitely wanted to make was just um i am i'm i so even if there was this broad consensus in favor of moral realism or some specific moral realism um i'm just not sure that why i i would assume that philosophers um are particularly reliable at getting at the truth um so so it, like in general when it comes to like deferring to experts um i mean i, th I think that the way i would look at this is well you know there are some cases where experts can uh, uh sort of demonstrate their expertise with with respect to specific things so if there's somebody who is you know a cancer surgeon or something um then it might be the case that he just has this long list of people that he's performed surgery on. And uh, I can just see that those people, it's like, okay, well, they had cancer and, you know, they, they went to this surgeon, like most of them lived and most of them ended up cancer free. Okay. So, so that sort of thing, it's like, yeah, okay, well that demonstrates that this guy is successful with respect to the thing that matters to me, right? Like if I have cancer and I, I need surgery, um, I can check that this guy is successful with respect to the thing that matters there. Um, and then the, like other examples would be things like, you know, constructing earthquake resistant buildings, right? Like if I, uh, we can just, we can just look at the engineers and architects and so on who have been successful at creating buildings that are earthquake resistant. Um, with philosophy, it's a lot more tricky though, because like the, the question here is, well, what is, 
the fact of the matter in this particular case, right? Like, is moral realism true or is moral anti-realism true? So we need to show that philosophers are reliable at getting at the truth. Um, but that's not like, I mean, I'm only going to be able to assess that if I've like already myself worked through a whole bunch of philosophical arguments. And like the only way I can assess whether some philosopher is accurate at getting at the truth is if I myself have become an expert in philosophy, thought through a bunch of philosophical arguments, and then can sort of say whether or not they've come to what I consider to be the right position. Um, but then at that point, I mean, I don't really even need to defer to experts anymore because I just would be an expert in the field. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much where I am. Like, I, I don't think there's any sort of independent way of demonstrating um, that you have gotten to the truth of, with respect to some philosophical question. Right. So this is in, in the blog series, this is what I, where I say uh, expertise matters. And what I argue is that, well, philosophers are probably experts in many respects, like experts at evaluating arguments and, and uh, formal logic and probably understanding the history of philosophy, knowing how to interpret particular philosophy. Someone might be really good at telling you what Kant actually meant in a particular article. Uh, I don't think that they've demonstrated an expertise at getting philosophical questions correct. And I, I make the same point you do, where what I say is that with respect to other sorts of things, engineering, being good at chess, um, being a good doctor, we have external means of corroborating that the people are good at what they say that they're good at. And I think that a lot of times when people appeal to philosophical expertise, they get the causality reversed. In these other cases, we consider the people experts because they have a, a demonstrated track record of success, whereas philosophers have not, I think, demonstrated a track record of success in the same way, at least not in any readily ve uh, verifiable way. Um, and yet they then want us to defer to their, their expertise and grant that they're successful. So in the other cases, it's your success is what makes you an expert. And here they want to say we're experts, therefore we're successful. I'm not willing to grant that. Mm -hmm. what, show that you're successful first, and then I'll consider you an expert. And so I see expertise as downstream of success, not you don't just establish ex expertise first and then declare that as an indicator of your success in the absence of any other way of evaluating your success. What the hell made you an expert? How, how do I know you're an expert? Uh, and, you know, uh, I've seen some uh, just uh, I got to be honest, asinine responses to this where they will just say, well, they thought about it a lot. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, Christian theologians thought about Christian theology a lot. Does that? Do I have to believe it? Be a Christian then? What, what the hell kind of answer is that? They thought about it. A it's a ridiculous answer. So you know, it's not just that they would need to demonstrate the relevant expertise. What I ultimately point to is that they need to demonstrate that they have a workable methods, and it's the methods that matter. And ultimately, it's the what is causing them to to converge on a particular beliefs that matters. It's not merely the fact that they're converging. What if all the philosophers had a brain parasite at a conference that calls them all to agree with each other? It's not a good reason to believe what they believe. <laughs> and if we found that out, I think that would be, it'd be a really weird argument that the contagious parasitic brain uh, uh, debunking argument, but <laughs> like it's, it, it's like a logical possibility. And if we did discover it, we would go, oh shit, actually they all think of it this way because of brain parasite. Okay, well now I don't care what philosophers think. Um, I mean, of course, that's absurd, but, you know, uh, I still want to know why they think what they do. And if they can't demonstrate that they're experts, okay, well, let's let's look at the methods. And I don't think that the methods are very clear or reliable or good. I do, I do want to backtrack just because I, I certainly don't want to say anything that I think is mistaken or incorrect. And I don't want to give the impression that I think analytic philosophy, as it's structured at any particular point in time or by its, its sort of intrinsic nature, uh, disposes people towards realism. Rather, what I, I, I think is that there are more complicated sociological forces at work. And one of the points I want to make about this is, let's say that there are people that are like convinced by Wittgenstein to be quietists. I don't see that as a sustainable long-term research program that's going to persist in academic philosophy, precisely because by its very nature, if you're just like, this is, an, this is a pseudo problem, this is a pseudo problem, this is a pseudo problem, I think psychologically that might just dispose people towards not wanting to persist and keep saying that all the time. And so uh, what I, I think is that pro like the ability to argue for something and do something in the field is the kind of thing that we should expect to persist. And so this is going to naturally disincline people towards positions like mine at the very least. So I do think anti-realists that fall within the analytic tradition do persist within 
that space. But positions like mine, where I see much of the dialectic is like fundamentally misconceived can see from the outset. I feel the pressure to, uh, and I've had people ask, why are you here? What's the point? Um, so I do think there's something sociological going on. There might also be something dispositional or personality based. I saw recent empirical research on this and they did not find personality features predicted people's philosophical positions. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to make of that. But I know William James talked about this in Pragmatism, that there's these like two different philosophical mindsets. I suspect there's something to it, but I haven't seen the evidence. Um, and then, uh, so what was the last point I wanted to make on this? Yeah, I guess just I, I'm pointing more generally to there being potentially social and demographic factors, but I also think those can be fairly localized. And so I don't think it has to be analytic philosophy pushes people towards realism, but that recent trends in the field could push people towards realism independent of whether that's representative of like what analytic philosophy does. And so I think certain popular figures at any given point in time can push the, the views of the field towards particular perspectives merely because some people are basically, I think a, a sort of local contention feature at any given point in time, certain positions have better PR right. and then they become popular for reasons unrelated to their truth. And I think realists and especially non-naturalist realists have had a lot of good PR in the past 30 years or so. Yeah. You know, on this point about um, the, the like demographics and the, uh, the sort of holding particular views that disincline you to uh, pursue certain projects, um, I'm just, I, I, I'm just thinking about my own case because I, I, I was always quite interested in like both philosophy of science and metaethics. And I ended up uh, pursuing more philosophy of science, right? Like that's what I did for my BA dissertation and my MA and then my PhD. It was all philosophy of science. But I know that for a while I was like, I was really interested in metaethics. And I mean, I could be misremembering this. I could just be making up some rubbish, but I'm pretty sure that like part of the reason why I ended up drifting away from metaethics for a while was because I was definitely inclined to non-cognitivism. And I always hated the fact that basically the last, you know, 40 years of non-cognitivism has just been about trying to respond to the Frege Geach problem, like in a way that would be satisfying to realists. Um, like that whole program just seemed to me to be completely mistaken. And it's like, there was no way, it, it was almost like there was no way into, uh, into meta-ethics for me without dealing with that and i just didn't want to deal with that because i thought this this whole thing is just a, it's just a complete waste of time like, you know? and uh so i don't know i mean maybe um uh yeah maybe I, I my own case would be like an example of this like yeah i mean people will choose projects based on what else is going on in the field that's that's pretty plausible um yeah, I, and to be fair, this is super duper speculative on my part. I don't have any concrete evidence for particular sociological forces at work. And if anything, what little evidence I've seen seems unsupportive and contrary to this. But I, I think there's something to it. Um, you know, just because one or two studies doesn't show big personality differences, predict big differences in philosophical views. I don't think it, it points against like broader sociological forces or yeah. like the PR example that I've given or the this idea that if there's not a good project to work on, you're just going to leave. But um, I, I think I do think that there's something to that. I think it's just very, very difficult to demonstrate that. What I want to point to on this front um, is what I take to be a, a general lack of curiosity about the sociology of philosophy and the methodology of philosophy. I'm, I, th of course, there is discussion. You know, I just finished reading a book from uh, Williamson on uh, philosophical methods. Um, it's like a short introduction to something like that. Uh, short intro to metaphilosophy, maybe? I don't know. Um, now, I'm, now I'm tempted to want to go find the book. Anyway, it's the short uh, Williamson book on methods and philosophy. Um, that got me distracted because I want to find the name of the book. I, I, <laughs> I, I will often see in comments someone saying, what was the name of that book? And then I have to go figure out what the heck I was talking about like a week before, like which book it was. Anyway. Uh, I'm getting sidetracked again, probably because we've been talking for a while. Uh, where was it? Oh, right. Is, you know, I I think that the proportion of philosophers that believe something um, that really matters, uh, like why they believe it, like what causal factors are, are causing them to believe what they do. And we shouldn't just rely on the naive presumption that whatever the distribution is, that's because people enter the field and then they were all persuaded accordingly. 
We don't know, right. for instance, what the base rate is. So here's here's one point, and I, I think I want to wrap up there because I think we've said a whole lot about this. <laughs> uh, imagine you're a moral realist that says, look, almost everybody, almost all ordinary people are moral realists. We could basically round up to 100%. And just for the sake of simplicity, we'll round up to 100%. And then you look at the proportion of, of meta-ethical views among philosophers, and it's only 62% realists, mm -hmm. and it's 26% anti-realists. Okay, so what's going on there? Um, if you think uh, that that distribution is reflective of people's responsiveness to the arguments, then it looks like nearly half of philosophers, once they started studying philosophy, renounced moral realism and a quarter of them endorsed anti-realism. Now, does a majority in favor of realism look like evidence for realism? Because right. now that kind of looks like evidence for anti-realism. I mean, you can imagine if 100% of people were theists and then you go look at specialists in philosophy of religion and it's 62%, and then a quarter of them are atheists, kind of looks like studying religion is more likely to make you an atheist. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, why, that's interesting it, because if, if, if it's, if you go with the argument from sort of like appeals to, you know, common sense and intuition and the face value of moral practice, that there, there now seems to be some tension with the appeal to expertise insofar as, well, actually we've got a quarter of these experts who are anti-realists. Right. And doesn't it matter why? So what if we found out, for instance, that if you if you could somehow scan everyone's brain and know the disposition that they had before they started or if they actually had a position before they started, mm -hmm. like as a as an undergrad, like the day they they're they're like starting as an undergrad and they haven't gone into their first class yet. And you 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 could perfectly scan all of them and you found 62 percent were realists and 26 percent were anti-realists. And then you look at the survey response. <laughs> OK, so studying philosophy has no effect on people. Mm -hmm. Now, what should we make of that? So. Uh, I mean, maybe it just indicates everybody has incorrigible starting points. There are individual differences that exist within the population already. And studying philosophy does not a damn thing to move people one way or another. Would that be evidence of realism? It's not clear to me. So looking at the raw percentage just strikes me as ridiculous. We need to know the causal directions, like what did they think before they studied philosophy? What did they think after they studied philosophy? Um, which arguments did they find, uh, wh like what factors were they responsive to that caused them to change their views? Uh, you know, what if we find out that realists are more charismatic and persuasive than anti-realists, and that's why they're realists, uh, like why people have moved towards realism. I'm not suggesting that because that seems like a, like, a, like a desperate ad hoc, like, ah, it's just because you guys are more, are, are cooler than us or something. I'm just saying that among other factors, there could be an unknown, like we, we don't actually know why people are realists or anti-realists in short. Yeah. And unless we know why, what does it matter what the proportion is? Right. Um, okay. So uh, I, I, um, I said at the very beginning when we started talking about this, I was probably inclined to put this in E tier. If anything goes in E tier, I think it would be this one. And I, I mean, our discussion has not inclined me to move it up any further. I, I still want to put it in E tier. <laughs> Um, I, I'm fine with it being an E tier. Okay. Uh, this, I mean, look, I have an entire, I, I have like a one month long where all my blog posts are dedicated specifically to talking about how much I hate this. Uh, so okay. I'm fine with, with this being an E tier. So um, I, I should, I mean, I, I guess we, I didn't like ask how much time you actually had today. We've been talking for three hours. Um, we still have two more arguments to go. I mean, do, do you have time to do that? We, it doesn't. Yeah, not, I have time. Okay. I, I had other stuff to do and it's already done so <laughs> like too bad for me i guess so i think we might as well wrap up because then otherwise i'd feel like we had an incomplete video and i'd be really frustrated so let's okay. just finish it yeah maybe not dwell on them too much let's try to get through them quicker depending right. on what they are though well it's it's the the moral fixed points and and humor's ontological argument um so do you want to do them or? I, I got we don't have to but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do you want to do you want to give an outline? Because you had a discussion with uh, Rush Schaefer Landau about moral fixed points, right? Or did you cover that as a, your own video? No, I no, no. The thing with Rush Schaefer Landau was um, I, 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 I knew I was going to talk to Russ, and so I went back and you know read a load of his work, and I read all the moral fixed point stuff, and I had things to say about it, and then he presented arguments from a, his new book, which wasn't out yet. Um, and so he didn't actually talk about the moral fixed point stuff, but I did make a video on it. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> my discussion with Russ Schaefer-Landau didn't actually cover this. Uh, so, um, 
I could, uh, yeah. So the basic idea here is, um, let me just check my, my notes. Um, ah, right, yeah. So this is just the idea that like there's various moral propositions that are just conceptual truths. Um, so uh, it is pro tanto wrong to torture somebody for fun. Um, or it is pro tanto wrong to impose severe burdens on other people just because of their physical appearance. Or um, it is you know, pro tanto good to give money to charity. The, the thought is that um, these claims are made true just by the concepts, right? So if, if somebody was to deny these claims, uh, we would say that they have, you know, made some sort of conceptual error. It would be like saying that, you know, that this bachelor is a married man. So if you were to say that it's pro tanto good to torture somebody for fun, that would be analogous to saying that a bachelor is a married man. Um, so the way that they put this slightly more technically is um, that X is F is a conceptual truth if and only if it belongs to the essence of F that necessarily anything that satisfies X also satisfies F. So unmarried men are bachelors. It belongs to the essence of bachelor that anything that satisfies unmarried man also satisfies bachelor. And then you know, recreational torture is wrong. It belongs to the essence of wrong that necessarily anything that satisfies recreational slaughter also satisfies wrong. Um, so, yeah, basically the idea is uh, there are these moral fixed points. They are the conceptual truths. And um, we can sort of use these conceptual truths as the starting points of moral reasoning, right? Like any... So we start off with conceptual truths and then we apply tools like conceptual analysis and inference the best explanation to derive further moral claims um that, is that that's it idea. that's that's pretty much the idea yeah is there so my initial re reaction is to say well hold up in what sense are they right or wrong like in a realist sense or some non-realist sense because I, I you know i'm certainly going to agree that it's wrong to torture people and you know whatever you know standard things that would be obviously awful uh, i'm gonna agree those things are bad but i'm gonna and I, I i'm totally comfortable saying they're wrong but the way in which they're bad and the way in which i say they're wrong is in an anti-realist sense uh yeah so it's going to be that well they're going to be uh independent so these are going to be truths that are independent of anybody's desires or values because so let's say that you personally just desire to torture people, you personally value torturing. If you were to say, well, it's pro tanto good to engage in recreational slaughter, your claim is mistaken. Um, you've just made a conceptual error. I think actually what they would say is that that you just don't have moral concepts in that case. Um, so... Uh, you know, like you could say the words, it is pro tanto good to torture people, but you must mean something different. Um, yeah, this just seems to yeah. be muddying the waters between normative ethics and meta-ethics in a way that looks to me to be entangling the two in a, in a highly suspicious way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm inclined to agree. I So maybe I should say a bit more about like why why these are supposed to be conceptual truths because they, they they give a few so there's there's four reasons um i say they who wrote this page it's russ schaefer landau and terence cuneo and somebody else anyway um the idea is is that if we take a claim like recreational torture is pro tanto wrong well <clears throat> there are certain features of conceptual truths in general that this claim seems to share so a conceptual truth would be something like you know uh, unmarried men are bachelors, right? Um, first of all, uh, necessity. So we cannot conceive of any possible world where there are unmarried men, or, or like where there are bachelors who are married. Just can't conceive of that. In the same way, we can't conceive of any possible world where recreational torture is a, is a good thing. Um, they appeal to bafflement so it would be completely baffling if somebody were to assert that there were bachelors who were married in the same way it would be completely baffling if somebody were to say that recreational torture is good um we know these things 
a priori. Uh, we don't have to engage in empirical investigation to figure out that, you know, that unmarried men are bachelors. We don't have to engage in empirical investigation to figure out that recreational torture is wrong. Um, so the sorts of features that you find in conceptual truths are the same features you find in these moral fixed points. I don't know if that moves yeah. you at all. <laughs> no, not, not even a little convinced. bit. <laughs> yeah, I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't, these don't seem like conceptual truths to me. I don't know why I should think that they are. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that's kind of like strange about this to me is that even if I was to accept that they that they were conceptual truths, I'm, I'm just not sure like how that gets us to any kind of realism at all, because, you know, you can have conceptual truths. So like it is a conceptual truth about uh, phlogiston, that phlogiston is an elemental substance and phlogiston is released during combustion. Uh, so, you know, like if somebody was to deny those things, it, it would just be like it, it would be kind of baffling. It's like, well, no, that's just what phlogiston is. Um, but of course, uh, phlogiston doesn't actually exist. Um, so so like it seems like the most that you would say you can say is, well, if phlogiston exists, then um, phlogiston is something that is released during combustion. And phlogiston is an elemental substance. Um, but the mere fact that we have these conceptual truths about phlogiston that doesn't that doesn't entail anything about whether or not there really is phlogiston um so in the same way the, even if there were these conceptual moral truths i i don't see why that would entail that yeah i'm not i'm not willing to grant that there are these kinds of conceptual uh, you know i mean one thing is yeah. i'm skeptical whether there are conceptual truths of this kind like in the case of phlogiston i see it as stipulative that by phlogiston i just mean a thing that has these characteristics by a bachelor, I just mean an unmarried man. And, you know, a proponent of the moral fixed points is welcome to say that by morally good or by some cert certain sort of claim, I just mean a thing that entails that it's pro tanto wrong to torture people. Well, okay, then it's, they're stipulating that by a certain word, they mean a certain concept. Like, so, so what? Uh, so, <laughs> like, I, okay, so they're using words a certain way. And those words refer to some concept. There's an infinite number of, so someone could come along and say, Look, you know, you've got your moral facts. I got some other set of facts. I can stipulate that I, I believe in bloral facts, and the bloral facts require you to torture the protanto wrong. And I can stipulate that there are bloral facts of that kind, and that those seem to me like I, I mean they're kind of ridiculous because no one uses that language and no one thinks that way. Uh, but that's not the point. The point just is all you've given me is by some word I mean something. Okay, good for you. I I don't. Why, why should I care? Uh, but this also does seem to me to be smuggling in normative consideration. So imagine I said I, I, you have, and you could do this with the, the aesthetic fixed points. So, I, like you and I probably would agree that certain types of music or food are better than other sorts of things. So we might agree that French fries taste better than rotting garbage or something like that. They taste better than feces. Yeah. Um, so, French fries taste better than feces. Um, can I say as one of the gastronomic fixed points that um, it's pro tanto better to eat French fries than feces? I mean, maybe I. <laughs> it it so, that, that like, seems that seems as reasonable as um, it as seems the to be fixed. smuggling in yeah. my gastronomic preferences, and and I think what this these arguments look to me like they're doing at, at least at first blush is they are banking on the fact that nobody wants to look like an evil monster by denying the normative content of the claims, and then they're smuggling the meta ethical stuff in along for the ride. When if all they said is, "Hey, you're you're against baby torture, right?" Yeah, okay, so am I. Um, then what more needs to be said? Um, if you want to say it's a conceptual truth that what it means for something to be wrong is it, like it, it, like this. there's this claim, it's built into the wrongness of the, the claim that, that baby torture is wrong, or it's built into the, the, the nature of our moral discourse that baby torture is wrong. I don't remember, the, can you give me an exact phrasing? Maybe I could just modify it. Okay, so uh, let's see, exactly. I don't see the mirroring their language. Yeah, the way that it's put is, um, uh, Recreational slaughter is wrong, right? This is a conceptual truth because it belongs to the essence of wrong that necessarily anything that satisfies recreational slaughter also satisfies wrong. Yeah, it looks like a normative claim to me, or at least a partially normative claim. And so it looks like I could do the same thing for aesthetic and, and gastronomic claims, and I don't see what the issue would be. And what, what I think gives this its rhetorical punch is the fact that 
virtually nobody that's going to discuss this with him is going to disagree with recreational torture being pro tanto wrong. Uh, but just imagine that the population was like 50% people that are, are actually pro torture. They're going to go that, of course, that's not a conceptual truth. It's actually a right. conceptual truth that the opposite is the case. And what's, what's going to be the argument against that? Why are they wrong? <laughs> well, yeah. I, what's the argument? I mean, we don't really even have to imagine this. You can just pick up like a book by the, the Marquis de Sade, right? So the Marquis de Sade argues in favor of uh, brutality and torture and suffering. And uh, he says that that's like, that's good. It's good to torture people. It's good to cause suffering. Now, my my initial reaction to that is, oh, right, well, he has different moral views to me. Um, it doesn't seem to me that he is conceptually deficient. I think he has moral concepts. He just has different moral views. Now, if you want to insist that... So here's here's the thing. I mean, you, you can insist that the Marquis de Sade just doesn't have moral concepts. So then I guess we're going to have to say that he has, like, schmoral concepts or blural concepts or whatever it is. But, but then, of course, I guess I just have these two conceptual systems, right? So I've got the moral system and the blural system. And, uh, like, okay, and, <laughs> and? And now I have to decide which one I favour. Uh, it looks like it's kind of, it lo looks like it's just going to be sort of up to me. Okay, like, I happen to prefer the moral system. The Marquis de Sade prefers the blural system. So, um, yeah, I, I don't find this to be very convincing at all um, but I, I mean look I, I see it seems to me when I read someone like the Marquis de Sade that he just does have moral concepts and comes to very different moral conclusions yeah I agree and I also think that we could point to ancient societies where certain practices that are considered abominable today would be considered normal and justified and, and right I, I mean people different societies are going to have very different conceptions of what's right and wrong than than we do and the and you know of course there's persistent moral disagreement even within our society but i just these it, these just look like they're just i i think that they're they're leveraging the fact that they're expecting an audience not to want to be willing to deny the meta ethical stuff by by embedding it inside the moral stuff so i think that this is this might be this might have rhetorical force insofar as it's exploiting this thing that i've talked about normative entanglement um so you've you, you're have we discussed this or Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give an example. So imagine there's a realist and an anti-realist having a discussion in front of an audience. Imagine you're like on like a, a, a news show and everyone's going to see this on TV. And the anti the realist knows the anti-realist is an anti-realist. And they know that they're, they have integrity and they don't want to lie in public. And so they say to the anti-realist, hey, yeah, so, you know, you're in a moral anti-realist, right? And they're like, yeah. They're like, okay, well, let me ask a question for you. Uh, and, they're, and they say, um, do you think it would be... Um, objectively wrong or they could say stance independently wrong to torture like a million babies for no reason at all just just for fun <laughs> just sadistically just torture a million babies just for fun do you think that's objectively wrong no what are their options they can't if they don't want to they could lie and say yes um or they have to say no what do you think the audience reaction is going to be is the audience going to go oh okay well yeah consistent with anti-realism of course no they're going to think the person's at, at the very least less opposed to torturing babies than the person asking the question they're going to think, wow, this person's a monster. What is wrong with them? And yet that they're a monster. Why? Because they don't, I mean, you could swap out stance independently wrong. So basically here, here's what's going on. They're embedding the normative claim inside the meta ethical claim such that to reject the meta ethical presupposition implicit in the claim as a whole, like the conjunct of the whole claim, um, pragmatically implies that they may, or in fact do reject uh, the normative claim as well, alongside the meta-ethical claim. Um, and so you could reveal this by asking like a realist, let's say a naturalist realist, hey, do you think baby torture is magically wrong? Well, they don't think it's magically wrong. So what do they, they have to say? No, no, I don't think it's bad. Oh, so you don't think it's wrong. So you're evil. Okay, you're pro-baby torture. So it's the same thing here. All I'm saying when saying it's not stance independently wrong is that it's not stance independently wrong. I'm not telling you anything about whether I think it's wrong normatively and I'm not telling you anything about my attitude towards it. I so what you could do, and you could demonstrate this, is like you could you could engage in Gricean cancellation. You could say, in response to, do you think it's objectively wrong to torture babies for fun? Um, no, I don't think it's objectively wrong, but I do think it's extremely wrong and repugnant, and I hate it, and I would I would actively work to stop people from doing it, and I'm really opposed to it, and I'm disgusted by it, and I'm just as opposed to it if uh, equally, if not more so, than you are. Hmm. And there's no contradiction there. Yeah. And so that buffers you against the implication. But if you don't say all those things, you're going to look like a monster. 
And I think the same thing is at work in these sorts of statements where, what are you going to do? Say you don't think it's pro tanto wrong to torture people? Like you're going to look like a monster. And so no one's going to want to say that. And I, I think that there's there's something suspicious about that. Um, okay, then. So, um, all right, well, where does where does this go? I, I, I'm not really very convinced by this at all. Um, I, I mean, I, I might... I, I really hate the expertise argument, so I, I, I could be persuaded to put it in D, but um, I wouldn't put it any higher than that. Okay, I'm inclined to put it in D instead of E for one simple reason, which is I'm going off of you giving me a description of this. I sure. think I might have read the fixed points paper, but I don't remember it. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure I read it and it's like totally escaped my mind. I don't know it well enough to evaluate it. So I'll be merciful and give it a D instead of an E. Yep, I mean, look, again, you know, I mean, I... <laughs> Obviously, I gave a very quick summary, and there's a lot more that they say. Um, so, you know. So maybe there's, there's more things to say where I would. I'm. It's very unlikely I'm going to be convinced, but I might go. Okay, I see where they're going with this. This makes more sense, or this sounds more plausible than I initially thought. Same thing with deliberative indispensability. Sure. Yeah. Um, final one then. The last one. Uh, now, something that is concerning me here is that something has to go in S tier and we're now on the final argument and nothing's well, in not S tier yet. So ontological this... argument is not going in S tier. <laughs> it's uh, Michael Humer's ontological argument. Um, all right then. So I'll just give a quick summary of how this works. So uh, here we go. Um, premise one. Huber appeals to something that he calls the probabilistic reasons principle. If some proposition P would, if you knew it, provide a reason to do X, then having a reason to believe that P might be true also provides a reason to do X. So, um, like, let's say, um, oh, what would be a, a good example here? I, I mean, okay, but, well, let's say that, you know, I'm walking in the woods and, like, I... I, I I know that there's a lion in front of me. Well, that gives me a reason to stop walking along that path. Um, we might say, well, you know, if you're walking in the woods and you you come to have a reason to believe that there might be a lion on that path, right? Maybe you can't see the lion, but you can see the paw prints or something. Well, that also provides you some reason not to walk along that path. Maybe the reason not to walk along that path is no longer quite as decisive as it is in the case when you know that there's a lion there, but it still provides something, it still provides some support. So if, if some proposition P would, if you knew it, provide a reason to do X, then having a reason to believe that P might be true also provides a reason to do X. And then the rest of the argument goes as follows. If we knew that torturing babies was objectively wrong, this would give us a reason to refrain from torturing babies. Uh, if we knew that torturing babies was not objectively wrong, that would give us no reason to torture babies. Uh, we have some reason to believe that torturing babies is objectively wrong. Uh, and the reason why, so even if you're an anti-realist, you have some reason to believe that, uh, that torturing babies is objectively wrong. Because even if you're an anti-realist, you should accept that, you know, you could be wrong, right? And I, I mean, like, so both of us, we're both anti-realists. But we should probably have some epistemic humility. We should accept that, yeah, I mean, we, we could be mistaken. Like, like, maybe we've, you know, just missed something. Maybe we haven't assessed the arguments and evidence very as well as we could have done. Like, maybe the 65% uh, of specialists who've come down in favour of realism have seen something that we haven't, um, seen something that we've missed. So, yeah, we could be wrong. Um so, so we have some reason to believe that torturing babies is objectively wrong. And therefore, given the probabilistic reasons principle, we just straightforwardly have a reason to refrain from torturing babies. And that's the argument. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So this, I mean, one thing I would say is that this argument wins points for audacity. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree. I, I, I look, I, I don't want to put it in S tier, but I agree that it it's not at the very bottom. Like I, I kind of like ontological arguments because they're sort of ballsy. And so. So we're know. on the same page, even for the rationale behind it. Yeah, <laughs> right. this this look, uh, one thing I could say about um, 
humor's arguments is that humor has a, a tendency towards being direct, straightforward, doesn't bury the lead, presents his case bluntly. And I, I like that about, about humor's approach to things, even though I disagree with humor about the realism stuff. Um, so I'll give it that. Uh, it's, and also it has, it's clever. This is, this is a, a fun paper to read. Yeah. So, um, I think that for, for me, um, I mean, that, so that I suppose that the big problem with this argument for me is that I don't accept that the probabilistic reasons principle is, uh, is like stance independently true. I don't, I don't think that it, it, we have. So what Humer wants to say is, well, if some proposition P would, if you knew it, provide a reason to do X, then having a reason to believe P that, that P might be true um, also provides a reason to do X. I think, but I don't think there are stance independent reasons in general. So, I mean, in a, in a way, I can, I can maybe see this type of argument, like connecting to something like the companions in guilt argument, where... You know, if you're inclined to think that the, that something like the probabilistic reasons principle is just stance independently true, well, like maybe then that is going to lead you towards, uh, you know, objective moral norms via via Hume's type of argument. Um, but yeah, I, I since I just reject stance independent reasons in general, stance independent normativity in general. I don't accept the probabilistic reasons principle as stands independently true. So in, I guess the argument kind of doesn't get off the ground for me. Um, so that's where I am with yeah, it. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that. And so it doesn't get off the ground for that reason, but the ways in which it doesn't get off the ground for me are sort of overdetermined by other considerations. And this is one where I'm not sure, I, I, I suspect we're not on the same page on this, which is that uh, I don't know what, I don't know what humor means by a reason. And this gets us into the territory where if he's invoking the notion of irreducibly normative reasons or the, you know, external reasons or the, you know, what, like whatever parfait is getting out when he's talking about reasons. Uh, I don't know how to evaluate the argument because I literally, I, so uh, I have to be careful about how I frame this. Um, I suspect that the, 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 pre that the premises in this argument, uh, at least those that invoke the notion of reasons are not meaningful. And mm -hmm. so like technically speaking, they're not truth apt. And so I'm not even like, I, I did this for arguments for psychophysical harmony, where I argue that because at least one of the premises is unintelligible, technically it's not an argument. Because, <laughs> so, so I argued not that the argument for psychophysical harmony is wrong. I actually, I, I titled it, I was trying to be bold, like, like humor. There is no argument for psychophysical harmony. Yeah, You actually can't argue for it because you can't put together premises that are intelligible. And this is how I feel about this argument, but I don't want to get into that. I think it would be too long. I think that's too distinctive and idiosyncratic of my own views and there's no way to make a case for that. But what I will say is that I am trying to build a case. Maybe, for the maybe, view. Wait, wait. maybe you don't want to say there's no way to make a case for that. <laughs> that might, <laughs> you just said, you just said with respect to the unintelligibility point, there's no way to make a case. Uh, oh, I mean, within the limited time right. frame that, we're, we're operating under, which is, this is the last one. I don't yeah. mean there's no way, like in general, I mean, yeah. there's no way like right now to, to do it justice and for it to be a remotely reasonable thing to do because it's, it's a kind of, it's a difficult case. But what I will say is, I think there's something suspicious about the use of reason here, the term reason. Hmm. And what I will say is that I, I recently found that Parfit himself uh, talks about Bernard Williams denying that his concept of reason is intelligible in on what matters volume two like rather explicitly like william just outright says yeah i think your notion of reason is unintelligible and parfit goes on to talk about this and to say yeah the, like parfit seems to indicate this is a possibility on the table that parfit himself may misunderstand his own concepts so parfit says that and one of the things i, would fi I find strange about when i suggest hey maybe this use of reasons doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, I've often had people react by saying, like, nobody thinks that. This is a ridiculous view. It's not represented in the literature. And I, I mean, it might be a ridiculous view, but it is represented in the literature in, in a sort of tangential way where it's mentioned in passing. People have said these sorts of things. What is true is that, to my knowledge, nobody has written an argument, like a paper arguing, uh, like, that th there's something off about this use of reasons. So maybe that's got to change. But what I would say is it, just to... to 
make it, you know, to simplify it, I am not sure how to evaluate the truth status of the premises in these arguments, because at the very least, I think that the, the account, like, there's, there's insufficient unpacking of what's meant by reason. And my strong suspicions are that there wouldn't be any meaningful account to give that would favor an especially realist characterization of reasons. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think we're basically on a, on a on a similar page here then because well I don't know if I I I I would want to forward the unintelligibility claim. I think what I would say is just something like you know I can tell you what I mean when I use the word reason, and I can tell you that when I say what I mean, realists yeah. tell me that's not what they mean. Um, so I don't know. Do I? have their concept like I, I i don't i don't know i mean um but certainly with respect to something like you know so how does humor put it if some proposition p would if you knew it provide a reason to do x then having a reason to believe that p might be true also provides a reason to do x yeah i mean these sorts of claims like this is just something i would cash out in terms of well you know there's certain like desires that i might have and then i can think about the ways of satisfying those desires you know goals means of satisfying goals that's how i'm going to think about reasons here um and so yeah that's one issue i suppose another issue is just that it isn't entirely obvious to me that so which premise is this what what is it so ah uh, yeah, yeah um, well yeah, there, I mean, but he also adds the premises of the anti-torture argument are independent of interests, desires, and attitudes. So by stipulation or argumentation, I think he, he says he's going to argue for the particular views that he has. Um, the account on offer is one where my reductive account or, or limitativist account of reasons, it, whatever it is, whatever my account is, that is not the account of reasons he's on, he's using. So I don't get to impute my, my conception of reasons into it and have the argument go through. It doesn't go through. So whatever he means by reasons, it's not what I mean. And I don't know what he means. And I suspect it's not meaningful. But even if it is meaningful, I don't know the meaning. And so how, how the hell am I supposed to evaluate the argument? There's still an epistemic issue here, which is that in order for me to evaluate an argument that draws on a particular set of concepts, I need to grasp the concepts. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course. <laughs> um... That there is one other point that I think is worth making about this, which is um, if so, we can ask the question, well, if you came to believe that there were objective moral facts, would you think so? So I could come to believe that there are objective moral facts, but then it seems like in principle, I could come to believe that the objective moral facts are just completely unexpected. Like. I, I might come to believe that it's an objective moral fact that torturing babies is actually acceptable. Um, so, of course, in, in that case, like, so if I recognize that, like, well, yeah, I mean, there could be objective moral facts. The objective moral facts could be completely different to my moral values. Then there's a sort of parallel of Humer's argument that leads me to the conclusion that I have some reason to torture babies. Um, so like as long as I recognize that it's epistemically possible that uh, there are objective moral facts and it's it's epistemically possible that those objective moral facts are such that you ought to torture babies, then you get an exactly parallel argument to the conclusion that uh, I already have, you know, a reason that's st like a stance independent reason to torture babies. Um, yeah, I, I think that that might work. But there's also it, it, it immediately brings to me, mind for me a kind of a reverse Morian shift or like my own version of it, <laughs> which is that if the conclusion, I mean, maybe it's not exactly Morian shift, but if the conclusion is that I have a reason to do something, in this case, it's like to avoid torturing babies. Well, I already want to avoid torturing babies. So, OK, I have a reason to do it. Great. I wasn't going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, but if we suppose that the conclusions of Humer's argument result in I, my having reasons to do things that I don't want to do. Um, like I'm, in, I'm inclined to, to pull the kind of um, like some kind of human move to say, well, I'm uh, sorry, not human move, Morian, uh, Morian move is to just say, well, that's less plausible than that, that I just should do whatever I want to do. I mean, that would be one thing, but I'm not inclined to say that I should do what I want to do. And like, I wouldn't even say that I would yeah. have an even more deflated view than that. I, I would rather just say something like this. I think as a matter of descriptive fact, like as a, not a normative fact, a descriptive fact, I only act in accordance with my goals and desires, and I don't desire to act in accordance with whatever whatever external reasons there might be. I just don't, I don't care about them. I don't care. 
they, if they aligned with my goals and interests, I would do them because they're my goals and interests and not because they're external values. Um, and so if I were to discover, as far as I could tell, like reflecting on my own psychology, if I discovered that there were stance independent moral facts, unless it turned out that in virtue of believing them, I was thereby motivated to comply with them, in which case, of course, as a descriptive fact, I would comply with them. If they're not accompanied by this sort of necessary motivation, I'm not interested. I don't care. I'm not going to do them. And so at the very least, what I mean, what is humor gonna, then going to do? Say, OK, well, there's a, you have reasons to do things. OK, great. I don't care. What now? Well, maybe, maybe I mean, maybe uh, maybe you, there can be facts about what you ought to do, but you just don't care about them. Um... I, yeah, there could be. Uh, then uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to start being concerned I'm, about triviality here. I, I because mean, I mean, mor moral, so, so moral realism. I, I suppose to be fair to the moral realists, right? Like they're, they're just making a claim about, um, you know, the sort of, you know, metaphysics and maybe epistemology, right? They're saying, okay, there are these stance-independent moral facts, um, but in itself, that doesn't say anything about whether people will be motivated to act in accordance with them. Oh, I agree. I just, I don't take this to, to, if someone says, hey, look, I've got a successful argument that there are stance independent moral facts, but nobody, but you don't care about them. Like that doesn't mean that they're not the facts, you know, for the same reason any district. So if someone says, hey, the sun is actually, you know, made out of cheese. Okay. Well, if that's a fact, I don't, I, well, I probably would care about that, but uh, I don't have to care about some inert descriptive fact. Like if someone tells me how many pebbles there are on Pluto, like, right. okay. Uh, but that's that's not really the issue. I, the issue really is that if human psychology functions in this way, it might not just be me. So if it turned out like nobody cared about the moral facts in and of themselves, that would be a problem. If it turned out lots of us didn't, that would be a problem. Um, so that there are at least like there's still cleanup work realists are going to have to do, even if they had a victory. And I think that that's worth pointing out. Uh, you know, it's like okay, even if you got a victory here, it might be. It might be a very pyrrhic victory. You're just not going to get anything with out of these facts. And the other thing I would say is I think a lot of realists, especially non-naturalists, don't want that. They want to get something out of them. And yeah, so I mean, I guess that's kind of the uh, the motivation for, for non-naturalism in a way is that, well, they worry that naturalism doesn't give you the oomph. It doesn't give you the, like, authority. Um, the right. non-natural non facts are supposed to, supposed to have that oomph, that force, that authority. Um so, right. And, and there's other stuff they could say, which is that they could say, as a matter of psychological fact, most rational agents would find these facts motivating. And maybe I'm just, you know, uh, like, a, you know, there's something wrong with me. I lack empathy or I, I lack the concepts and they will make those moves. But I, I do think that that's worth pointing out. That's not really why I reject the argument. I just think I I also often think that the arguments are like, a, you know, it's already overdetermined and not getting off the ground. Yeah. Um, but then a lot of these arguments, I think, even if they went through, would still have problems anyway. Sure. So, um, okay, well, where does this one go? Um, I, 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 I would be inclined to put this fairly high up, actually. I mean, I, I think that it's... Um... Okay, so, yeah, my, my feeling on this one is I like that it's quite audacious. Um, I do think that in the same way as the Companions in Guilt argument, it, it sort of raises an issue for, you know, so if people... Because the, the probabilistic reasons principle is the kind of thing where some people might just say, oh, yeah, well, I guess that is stance independently true or whatever. And if you're going to hold that sort of view, then this argument does pose some problems for you if you want to be a moral anti-realist. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would put it, I'd probably put it around like A or B. Um, so, yeah. I, I'm not convinced it's that good. Uh, I, maybe I put less stock in the fact that it's audacious. So I'm, I'm more inclined towards a C, so I don't know where we want to put that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to compromise on, on C. So that means that it's, it's, it's with the, uh, the face value argument and the phenomenal conservatism. I yeah. Know, let's, I, let's think, is it better than, the, it's better than those. So how about B? Okay. Um, the problem is, is and then that that's already, you already said a B, so that yeah. would still leave us in the agreement zone. Okay. The, okay. The, so the, that's all of them, right? Yeah, we've done all of them, but we're, we're left with nothing in S tier. Um, the highest the highest one we have is the moral convergence argument. So I guess that just has to be bumped up to S. Um. <laughs> we could just say there's no S. Uh, <laughs> it's not, not acceptable. I, do you want to do like a bonus round on, on naturalist realism or should we do a whole different video on that like, there's like i guess less versions to consider or less arguments. i mean we could we could do uh we could do one on on that i mean i can't do that now i've, I've been talking for too long and 
you know. Yeah, me too. I can't, I can't switch over to that for listeners. Um, but I, you know what? I just want, I want, I just want to get this list done. So is compa- So here's the thing: the A tier is now empty. Um, companions in guilt or humans ontological argument? Which which of those is better? Um, okay, hold on. So you put moral convergence in S tier? I've, I've I've shifted it up because there's nothing else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One thing I should say then is that means that like humor is just far and away like the winner of moral realism because <laughs> he's all over the place here. <laughs> yeah. Um, damn. Yeah. Um, so. Wait. B- so where did where was this argument? This argument was B. So humans ontological argument is B tier, and companions in guilt is B tier as well. Um, so and then phenomenal conservatism is also B tier, right? No, that's in C tier. Oh, that's in C tier. Okay. Yeah. So then the question you're asking is, does I, which one of those companions of guilt or ontological goes in A tier? Yeah, that's right. I think Companions in Guilt, because I think it's a little clearer how it pushes the dialectic forward. I suppose with Companions in Guilt as well, although we, we talked specifically about the, the epistemic Companions in Guilt argument, there's there's like five different ways of running this, because you can appeal to epistemic norms, you can appeal to uh, uh, practical normativity, you can, yeah. Um, yeah, I, basically what I, I, I think that, I'll just say, I think it successfully pushes it towards you got to be a normative anti-realist or a normative realist okay and you're not there's not going to be a good there's not going to be a very comfortable space for anybody in between i think people can try that is quite successful then i mean in terms of what that argument is setting out to do so it's probably fair to put it and so yeah i think that that's a powerful move um and i'll give it credit for that so i think that it should be ontological in b and companions and guilt in a okay so the overall list then to to finish it up here's what we've got we've got s tier is the moral convergence argument which is that's surprise i feel i don't think that should be an s tier I, but neither you know, do i i'm this... looking at that and i was going to ask do you want to flip these around yeah okay fine oh my god are we going to end up with so oh god no no the companions in guilt does that is mean S-tier? companions in guilt is the s tier argument oh no <laughs> It can't I, be, can it? <laughs> it is. Okay, well, this is what we've ended up with. Companions so of Guilt. So I think I think I would want to flip them and put Moral Convergence in A and Companions of Guilt in S. Do you agree? Yeah, well, that's what I've just done. Yeah, Companions and Guilt in S tier. Moral okay. Convergence oh, in A. geez. Okay, so <laughs> who's the winner of philosophy then? It looks like it's it's Terence Cuneo and then yes. yeah. Humor. Um, but Humor has A, B, and C. And he has, uh, yeah, he has A, B, and C. So, yeah, so just to, just to uh, say what the list is, right, we've got S tier, Companions in Guilt, A tier, Moral Convergence, B tier, Humor's Ontological Argument, C tier, the Face Value of Moral Practice and Phenomenal Conservatism, D tier, Deliberative Indispensability, Morian Shift, The Moral Fixed Points, and then E tier, the Expertise Argument. So that is the list. That one interesting I, and maybe uh, like kind of a meta feature is that the expertise defense isn't an argument philosophers make. It's an argument that non-philosophers make, and it ended up as the worst argument. So maybe that is a testament to philosophers expertise. <laughs> and then in virtue of that, we have to move the expertise defense up. Oh, no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of self-arguing. Yeah. Um, OK, well, yeah, well, that's. That's the list. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with that you. I, mean, I, I really didn't want to end up saying that Companions in Guilt is the best argument of the lot. That's... Oh. Can, can you imagine any... There's. I think the one that I would be the most comfortable with it being at the top is the ontological argument. I feel like that would be a fun winner. Yeah, I actually agree. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think it is the winner. I just no. want it to be. No, I, I agree. I think at the end of the day, that's probably uh, that's probably the stance independently correct uh, <laughs> uh, form of the list. Right. Fair enough. OK. Well, I, I guess that's it then. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have anything else to say. If you have anything else you want to end on, um, I'll turn it over to you. But I'm 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 done. That's it for me. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say that I think we're, we're going to put this on both of our channels. So if you're a subscriber on one of the channels, check out the other channel, like and subscribe. So I'm Lance Independent, you're Kane B. That's right. Okay. All right. Well, goodbye, everybody. <clears throat>